Oh. Yeah. Found the guy. Yeah. 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 They apparently put out a
reading some of the documentary history that comes out of this meeting in the future. So if William comes up to you, please share with him and please offer your stories. And if you have any good stories, please just approach him. So with that, I will turn over to our first panel of elders, Anne Markham, <laughs> and to our own elder statesman, Peter Yazzie, who will bring us in. Thank you. Thank you for all coming. And let me say, you, you, you should have, they were attached to your agendas, a set of bios for the distinguished members of this panel and the panels that follow. And because we have a lot to cover and time is limited, I'm going to commend those bios to you and simply uh, introduce our panelists in, in, in much, much less detail, reflecting many fewer of their distinctions than would otherwise be appropriate. We are, we are joined today by Miriam Nisbet, the former director of the Office of Government Information Services at the National Archives. Greg Babiak, who's the global head of regulatory <clears throat> affairs at Bloomberg LP, Ted Whitehouse, senior counsel at Wilkie Farr and Gallagher, Mark Erickson, partner at Steptoe, and finally, Ed Black, president and chief executive officer of CCIA, the Computer and Communications Industry Association. And these guys could talk about many things, but the thing that we are going to be asking them to talk about today is a famous non-event, a thing that didn't happen, <laughs> and the, the, the non-occurrence of which may represent the most significant single accomplishment of what might be broadly called the public interest caucus where IP law and policy is concerned. And I'm referring, of course, to the non-recognition of sui generis database protection rights in the United States, which, among other things, represented a joint effort or the outcome of a joint effort which was both imagined and steered throughout by our, our friend and honoree, Drew Adler. Tiny bit of background, just a tiny bit, because you don't want to hear me talk. <clears throat> 1992, everyone's sort of minding their own business. There's a long-standing debate, more or less more technical than, than, than substantial among mm -hmm. Copyright experts about how much or how little copyright protection extends to compilations of data, and the Supreme Court takes a case. This is the 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 the, the Feist versus Rural case, which is supposed to iron out a kind of statutory detail relating to the application of copyright law to compilations of facts. In other words, we know facts aren't protected by copyright law. We know that compilations of facts get some kind of protection, but the rest of the details are vague. So they're going to they're going to interpret the statute, and we'll find out. And then the case proceeds more or less as normal, and the court decides the case. Except they decide it as a constitutional issue rather than an issue of statutory interpretation. <laughs> they decide it unanimously, although only eight of nine justices actually join Sandra Day O'Connor's opinion. And they decide effectively that under copyright law, only the narrowest scope of protection for compilations of facts is constitutionally available and permissible. And everyone is slightly taken aback because this is not the decision we were expecting. But we notice that it has occurred, and we appreciate, although it takes a little while to sink in, 
what its <coughs> implications are and how far-reaching they are, and they are far-reaching. They affect the, the future of copyright law, it, the theory of copyright law almost <coughs> as it is applied to many different subject matters, but they have immediate, direct consequences for entities, business entities, that are trying to capitalize on factual compilations, both in traditional <laughs> print form and now then in increasingly in electronic <clears throat> form. And of course, they also have very, there are very real implications for data consumers as well, who can suddenly see themselves as being potentially free to do a lot more with facts derived from compilations than any they had ever previously imagined. So it's a, it's a new world. And not surprisingly, and we'll hear more about this in a moment, the companies that have either already got sunk investments in data <coughs> compilation or that aspire to become the, the, the masters of commodified data sets don't like this outcome very much and begin thinking immediately about how they might, through a legislative initiative, <clears throat> undo or at least significantly revise it. And the problem, of course, is the one that I've just suggested, which is that it's a constitutionally based ruling rather than merely a piece of statutory interpretation. So the theory that the proponents of database protection come up with in the years immediately after 1992 is that we can pass new non-copyright sui generis database legislation under the warrant of the Commerce Clause <clears throat> rather than Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8, which was what the Supreme Court was interpreting in the Feist decision. And we can do all the things that the Supreme <coughs> Court said you couldn't do constitutionally under copyright, like protect the so-called sweat of the brow that the compilers of informational databases and other collections of information invest in, 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 their, in their, their establishment and their maintenance. We can do all of that outside of copyright under a new Article 1, Commerce Power Heading. And this, of course, provokes academic dispute one way or another, but it also provokes legislation. And beginning in, in 1996, there are a series of bills, the first of which was, was H.R. 3541, I think, uh, the, the Moorhead Bill, which essentially say, Acting under the commerce power, we are going to create a right to compile data that's separate and apart from copyright law. And the issue is joined. And then it's joined again and again and again in successive Congresses throughout the 1990s. And in, at the end, as we'll hear, this effort does not succeed. It is or leads to the non-event with which, to which I referred in my original remarks. Meanwhile, a similar thing is going on outside the United States. In 1996, the European Union enacts a database protection law, which is then implemented in the various countries of the EU. And at the same time, uh, a variety of countries led, interestingly, by the United States begins putting pressure on the World Intellectual Property Organization to include a new international treaty mandating sui generis, sweat of the brow based database protection under international law. So everybody who's working this issue on both sides of the issue is, is really working it in several different places at the same time. There's a European part, which has to do with the enactment and implementation of the database directive. There's an international part, which has to do with the treaty proposals that are pending in, in, the, in Geneva, and then there's the US part, which is, I think, going to be the main focus 
of our discussion today. And the format for this panel and for the panels that follow is going to be very simple, and that is that I'm going to pose a, a kind of a, an icebreaker question to each of our panelists. <coughs> we'll go down the panel with the answers to those questions, and then we will have the opportunity to talk among ourselves more generally, and I hope to involve you, because in addition to this event of today having brought to Washington College of Law many, many, many old friends who are on the day's panel, I also see lots of other um, dear and well-remembered faces in the audience. So I hope that everybody will feel comfortable as the day progresses to, to chime in. Miriam, to start with you, what, why was this question one that engaged the interest and energies of the library community? <clears throat> well, um, first let me just say that when we talk about the library community or libraries, <clears throat> I was, um, I was <clears throat> legislative counsel for the American Library Association, ALA. But we worked then and work now almost always in coalition um, with each other. So when we talk about libraries, we're talking about all kinds. So um, the libraries, public libraries, university libraries, you name it. Um, so we worked, ALA worked regularly with ARL, <clears throat> that was true, um, with the law libraries, with the medical libraries, special libraries. Um, and I have to say that Prue was our fearless leader <laughs> in all of this, and um, really a mentor, certainly for me and for many other people. So we're talking all kinds of libraries. And why were we alarmed? Why was this an issue for us? It's almost, um, if you're you're talking really a core principle for libraries, and that is um, really protecting the public interest in access to information mm -hmm. and um, using information in, in all different ways. Um, so a bill like, or bills like those that, as you said, they just kept coming really was alarming because we were talking about a law that could potentially have a drastic effect upon the public domain. So we're talking shrinking the public domain um, and really tying up <clears throat> the public's access to facts, to data, to government works. Um, for purposes of uh, research, for scholarship, for teaching, really a, a very fundamental and something that the libraries cared deeply about. So that was our, that was our history. That's where we were coming from. Um, and then we found ourselves, not only with this remarkable series of introductions of this database protection bill, um, we also found ourselves being, um, we who think of ourselves as protecting the public interest, being um, attacked for having that kind of a public policy approach, um, and particularly by the publishers. Um, not a surprise, libraries and publishers have a very complex relationship. Um, <clears throat> and we were being attacked uh, for taking the position that we did, which is this was a very, very bad idea and particularly devastating, as I've said, um, and being called pirates. <laughs> so going from being what we would think of as, of course, the people you want on your side to being accused of piracy. Um, fortunately, uh, there were other organizations. There were consumers. There were industries who, like the libraries, believed that current law between copyright and contract 
uh, databases were already protected. They were well protected. This was not a problem. But we knew that if we did not, <clears throat> if we did not pursue alliances with like-minded organizations, businesses, consumers, um, we were not going to be able to defeat what then felt like a real juggernaut. Um, <clears throat> Sean, in his introduction, talked about communities. And I think that <clears throat> what you see here, <clears throat> I don't think of us as elders, but I do think of us <laughs> as a community that <clears throat> formed over 20 years ago, and still we have that sense of community. Thank you. I wanted to put the next question to Greg, and that is, when you came to this issue and, and began to see how the, how the lines were drawn and how the issues were defined, what was your assessment of the kind of the, the general policy context in which this was this was all taking place. Who, who did you understand the the forces, and what did you understand <clears throat> the the motives <throat> to be when you, when you when you when you first joined in, into this this campaign? Um, I hate to. Find other people's motives, no, no, but no. <laughs> uh, I I would say that clearly there uh, we got into this after the legislation had passed the House already. If memory serves me, it passed the House with only one dissenting vote, George Brown of Cucamonga, California. And if memory serves me again, he died three weeks later. So we started in a pretty big hole in the House. Uh, the motivations, I think, were pretty clear because if you, and again, not to, to cast aspersions on, on motivation, but to accurately describe certain business models, some people have uh, control of archival basic databases, and they would have, it would be a license to print money if they were able to control downstream uses of that data. While I sympathize with their desire to print money, uh, the fact of the matter is our systems work very well by striking a balance bodied and feist that protects property but yet permits breathing room for the development of new products, new ideas, new artwork, new science. <coughs> this would have, in fact, we, the, the title of this, this panel, which is in shorthand, Defeat of Database Protection, is that it's shorthand. It's a bit of a misnomer. Mm. Everybody up here likes database protection. My employer, Bloomberg LP, has literally tens of thousands of databases that we use internally, externally, in every way imaginable. And that's why we are spider senses with tingling here, because we've been able to protect our databases by contract, by encryption, by technological means, by, uh, by intellectual property in those instances, <laughs> sufficient creativity to warrant it. Um, and in fact, throughout this debate, which went on for five, six, seven years, or forever, depending on how you want to <laughs> mark the ADBC of this, uh, if you ask the, the other side, can you give me an example of a database that is not protectable under existing law? There was never such an example provided. Um, so your question, what, what were motivating people, I think what was motivating people was indeed in some instances, about they're, they're obviously the internet was relatively new in the mm -hmm. mid '90s. Um, incumbent businesses had a, some concern about how they would adjust to the internet, whether they would be disintermediated in some way, whether the transparency brought by the internet was going to threaten their business models in some way. So there was certainly a, a rational person would be looking out, trying to figure out what this massive tectonic plate change would mean for them. That was certainly part of it. The Feist decision, which you alluded to, certainly grabbed people's, their, people's attention as well. Uh, what the Europeans were doing with, in terms of database protection, 
uh, gave an argument uh, that all of these things together provided um, either a justification, if you're um, an optimistic person, or a uh, camouflage and pretext, if you're a pessimistic person, for archival database holders to go to the Hill and say, wow, we don't have protection. Wow, the internet's a problem. Wow, the Europeans have figured this out. We ought to go in the same direction. Um, and I, I think it's a, uh, speaks well of the system and the time that this actually did prompt, ultimately, a horrible marathon of a debate, but it did prompt a debate. And not coincidentally, as it played out on the Hill, it played out between two different factions. The Judiciary Committee, which has a certain worldview. Uh, the Commerce Committee, which has a somewhat different worldview. The Judiciary Committee historically has rarely encountered a new, something labeled as an intellectual property protection, which they haven't liked. <laughs> the Commerce Committee, by contrast, is looking perhaps more broadly at what the role of these building blocks of information are to information writ large, what information means to the economy writ large, and trying perhaps to strike a balance that would be more amenable probably to those of us sitting up here um, than to the archival database holder. So, uh, and I would, I, I would add, I'd be remiss, the, the coalition on the other side was an interesting and quite powerful group. Um, and had, uh, again, I think if you, you try to isolate what the, the unifying threat is, it would be that either, somehow, either in some cases by government mandate they'd come to have control of, of critical databases, in others by, uh, by perfectly admirable effort they'd come to have control of these databases. But in any event, they were poised to sit at the headwaters of the River Nile, trying to control tributaries coming off in a way that has historically not been permitted in our system. And I think finally, in a, a, uh, after six years of debate, the, the position really embodied by the House Commerce Committee at that point prevailed over that which was promulgated by the House Judiciary Committee. Ed. Miriam spoke a little bit a moment ago about the, the nature of the coalition <coughs> that, that came together to resist the legislative proposals to provide commerce power, power based, sui generis, sweat of the brow, connected protection. Can you, can you talk a little bit more, please, about how that coalition evolved over time and the different, the different elements and stakeholders who were pulled into it, please? Well, the thing, of course, starts out with the telephone industry. Christ was about copyright and white pages. The academics seem to have searched for problems. Courts in several circuits. Possible to speak a little closer? Oh, maybe if I speak to this thing. <laughs> That's what it's for. I was wondering. <laughs> <laughs> this technology thing eludes me. We're the old guys up here. Right? <laughs> we, we, we don't do technology. Um, I just think I have this booming voice. That... Um, and so Feist, of course, started out as a, as a fight between folks who wanted to publish phone books in competition with the telephone industry and the... Uh, Telephone industry, which made a lot of money, thank you, on yellow pages, and had no interest in making that possible, and it succeeded quite successfully, quite impressively, in establishing in some circuits a principle that copyright law protected those listings. Um, and so that's where this thing starts. And so, um, of course, we're happy about the loss in Feist, but starting point. Opposite, you know, for enthusiasm about something else. What the Supreme Court did that gave them hope, and this is terribly important, is it dropped a footnote that said that this constitutional preclusion of one of the brow protection for, for data was not absolute because there was this old case called International News Service against Associated Press, Associated Press against International News Service, that had adopted a notion of misappropriation. The idea was that a 
uh, a new service that had been banned by censorship for violent censorship regulations from access to frontline coverage in the First World War was simply stealing Associated Press's stuff and sending that back as its own. And they got sued over it, and the courts held that that was misappropriation and common law, commerce clause, compatible notion. So the Supreme Court drops a footnote and says, that doesn't, that survives in some form the result in Feist. This, of course, was a guilt-edged invitation to go legislatively promulgate uh, some kind of database protection under the guise of a misappropriation standard. And so that's how this thing got kicked off. And of course, as, as we get rolling, you start thinking, about who, who cares about that? Well, of course, scientific publishers were an early and big advocate for that kind of protection, Reed Elsevier being the primary corporate entity that did that, because they have all kinds of publications that, that were purely factual, purely uncreative, at the classic definition for an unprotectable <clears throat> cop by copyright under the Supreme Court's determination. And they make a lot of money on that stuff. Of course, they're protected by copyright, they're protected they by, by contract, rather, they're protected by encryption, they're protected by all kinds of, you know, they have not gone broke. But, but you wouldn't have believed that at the time. Uh, the world's ending. Uh, you had um, the stock exchanges. This is where I got the crazy idea that Bloomberg got client at the time ought to become active on this because you sort of appreciate that the stock exchanges and the <coughs> commodity exchanges own the trading data. Bloomberg doesn't have much profit margin left. This would be a catastrophic development. They had the good sense to see that that was true and they put Greg to work on protecting themselves from it. And that's how Greg and I met. And he did a really good job. At that, and I'd say that even if he weren't alive. But, but, you know, um, and so that was another source. Of, and and then of course, the realtors came up on the other side. They desperately wanted to protect that that multi-list database thing that they have from non-members of the National Association of Realtors having ready access to listing data for houses. And because that that's how they force all the people to become members of the realtors group was. The, only by doing that did you get access to the database. A lot of dues paying members that way. So that's a formidable adversary as well. They have incredible uh, grassroots, right? Because the realtors are the rich people in every community, large and small, and they, they, they give money to politicians. The price of the House of Representatives is very sympathetic to, to, to their concerns. So against that, what did we have to array? We had, of course, Competing directory publisher guys were early uh, participants. They sort of faded out because they ran out of money. Bloomberg became an ever more important participant in this as they were able to support the right answer on this issue. So they, they were a major player. The libraries, other public interest organizations uh, in the technology area that, that, that were came and went, but mostly had to add themselves on. Prue can no doubt give a detailed guest list, as we were meeting mostly in her conference room. Any of you who's ever been in, it's the top floor of that Cesar Pelli building on Beacon Circle, uh, window soffit that bangs your head when you look out the window, um, <laughs> but a fabulous view all the way up the <laughs> And we would meet there fairly regularly and have a fairly full room of people who, who had who represented in mostly what you think of as the public interest side of technology issues. Recognized the incredible importance of not locking up these data. John Gaffney's back there was uh, the alumnus of our law firm and a prominent uh, part of, of that group, and, and many of the others in this room were, were part of that. Some remember them. Hitting for me. But it, it is, so there, there was a lot of folks early on who figured out that this was a potential <clears throat> real threat to the public interest and to their commercial interests. And, and it proved to be a very congenial group, largely because of Prue's efforts to make everybody behave, um, need to behave. And a comment was made, as Prue will tell the story, but I can't resist stealing it from her, that we were having a lot more fun than the other side. Because it was a nicer group. 
And so it's one of those magic moments where sort of something very important comes up and people care about it who are guided in their desire to see the right answer. But we had the good guys. Greg said the other side never really had a good answer to why, aside from sheer greed, they needed any additional protection than they already had. There's no story they could tell of how somebody would actually get hurt. Well, it was cognizable and sensible public policy by making a change after Pfizer. Is that, Peter, an adequate answer to that question? Answer, <laughs> indeed. I, I hope that a, later on we, we may talk even more about some of the other elements that eventually came to that coalition, in, in a sense, as, as, as more forces lined up on the pro-legislation side, their counterpart, their, their, their consumer counterparts, so to speak, were mobilized. So as, as sports leagues recognized, for example, that they could <clears throat> be even more powerful if they owned sports data, performance data, mm -hmm. score data, lock, stock, and barrel, there was a countervailing group of fans, sports journalists, and others who saw the threat in such a development. It was a fascinating group. I would just say the thing that I most have said about it. I never worked on the European side, so I never got a European <laughs> <laughs> One other anecdote, the pirates point. They did call us the pirates. We were called that by a district court decision in the Yellow Pages case down in the, in the uh, Fifth Circuit that, uh, that, that uh, be interested in this. Um, Just because Ted drinks rum during the day does not make him a pirate. <laughs> I'll that out right now. I have a love for it. It's on my shoulder, and I, I go around saying, arg, matey, and this is true. Um, but the lovebirds don't talk, unfortunately. So it's that part of it. But um, no, the district court called us pirates. And, so my partner who argued the case in the 11th Circuit got up and opened his argument with, please the court, I represent the pirates. <laughs> now I'm going to tell you why that's not true. And it was a fabulous opening. It went well and we won, we won on, on on bonk rehearing. But. Great. Markham, looking, looking, looking back at the events that are are being described here. I wonder whether you can project yourself a little bit into those times and, and give us a, a basis to understand why technology companies <clears throat> came to feel that they were important stakeholders on the, the, the you could say, the open data side of this struggle. Um. Thank you, Peter, and, and Sean, thank you for hosting us and for the introduction. I will say uh, that uh, uh, I, I began representing uh, internet companies around the time of the commercial internet, and even at that time, though I was young, I felt old relative to my clients. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's all a matter of relativity, I suppose. But, um, you know, of course, at the beginning of the commercial internet, which is when the Feist decision was was uh, handed down by the Supreme Court, uh, the, leg the legal and regulatory regimes around the internet ecosystem were not yet um, uh, what they would become by the end of the decade. Uh, the digital millennium copyright had not passed. Uh, we know copyright is a strict liability regime, and uh, the very nature of the internet as a series of copying machines uh, created potentially massive liability for just the routine and and, uh, and automatic uh, functioning of, of what the internet did, which is to, uh, to uh, allow people to uh, send and receive communications uh, to each other. Um, so of course this meant um, at the beginning of, uh, at, in the mid 90s, uh, the debate surrounding the Digital Millennium Copyright Act was probably a paramount uh, concern to internet companies. And yet even then, uh, they were late to the game in that regard. I think there's a famous anecdote of the congresswoman representing Silicon Valley, uh, Zoe Lofgren. Okay, then I, I'll, I'll let you do that, uh, trying to call someone at Yahoo. Uh, 
Uh, so, so that was really the focus at the time. And I think uh, because largely of the libraries and Prue's advocacy and Miriam's advocacy, um, our, uh, it, the internet companies began to realize that this was uh, a potentially devastating development. That is the passage of uh, a sui generis uh, uh, intellectual property right uh, over, over facts. Uh, and indeed, as, as you mentioned, Peter, uh, the Database Protection uh, Act was, was included by the House in the passage of the DMCA. Uh, the Senate stripped it out, uh, fortunately for us. But I think at that time, really, it was probably only the libraries that were really seriously engaged in this issue. Um, and you did not have the, the uh, added coalitions. So having been alerted to the database protection debate by, by Prue and by Jonathan, who represented a, some of the internet companies as well, um, which uh, is, is, was, a, was a happy coincidence because he was in a position to really connect those two communities by, by virtue of his representation of the libraries and, and internet companies. Um, many of the internet companies, or I should say, some of the internet companies began to understand how important this, this, this debate was. But keep in mind that in the mid-90s, there were only about four internet companies that, that of any consequence or scale or inclination or ability to engage in policy matters. And those were AOL, Yahoo, Amazon, and eBay. That was pretty much it. Um, and uh, what complicated this, uh, they were not all unified in their position about this. So if you remember, uh, eBay was in the process of suing a company called Bitter's Edge. Um, eBay uh, obviously is what they are today, which is an auction site. Bitter's Edge was founded in 1997 as an aggregator of auction listings. So they would scrape the, um, the data from eBay and other auction sites, and they would provide a comparison tool um, so that you could, if you were a Bitter, Bitter's Edge user, easily search and compare among the different uh, auction sites. Um, after failed negotiations between eBay and Bitter's Edge over licensing or other terms, um, eBay ended up suing Bitter's Edge, and they sued under eight theories of liability, uh, trespass to chattels, a uh, Lanham Act violation, trademark dilution, Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, unfair competition, misappropriation, interference with prospective economic advantage, and unjust enrichment. So they threw the kitchen sink at, uh, at Bitter's Edge, um, and each side in that case argued that the internet would cease to function if they lost. Each side argued that, right? Um, eBay arguing that, um, that personal intellectual property rights, if they were not respected, uh, if, inter if information published on the internet could not be universally, uh, uh, if intellectual property rights and personal uh, data were not respected, um, then the internet would, would be destroyed. And conversely, Bitter's Edge argued that um, if information on the internet could not be universally accessed, the internet would be destroyed. Um, ultimately, the court sided with eBay under the theory of trespass to chattels. It was a prominent case at the time. Um, but on the policy side, that meant eBay was, was supportive of the publisher's argument uh, that, that databases needed to be, um, that, that there was a gap in the law and that databases need to be protected. Fortunately, um, Yahoo, which was a search engine and a much different business uh, than, than eBay, was convinced uh, that uh, opposing the database protection legislation was, was important. Um, and if you think about Yahoo's business, it makes sense. Uh, they're, they're collecting data from across the internet and making that data available on derivative downstream databases. And one might look at something like Yahoo Finance as the ultimate example of that, where they're aggregating a, a bunch of market data and other data and, and manipulating that data to create um, valuable uses of the data for consumers based on historical um, uh, market data. So uh, Yahoo uh, entered the debate strongly, um, was a, a member of the coalition, uh, and that's where I uh, engaged in, in working with the coalition uh, in, in um, opposing that. Um, uh, it was telling um, that, um, well, so let me say, um, interestingly, uh, I ended up representing Google a little later. And the way I got connected to Google was as Google began to become prominent, they realized there was a lawyer there, Alex, Alex McGillivray, uh, who realized that this was important to Google as well. Uh, they began to reach out and meet with people that were engaged in the debate. Uh, and they ended up being connected to the coalition because of the, uh, 
because of uh, the, our work uh, in, in, in that work. Um, uh, and I should say, eBay's uh, ability to prevail over Bitter's Edge, we felt vindicated our position that, the, that new sui generis property rights was not needed. That existing law, under either federal or state theories of, uh, of liability, could protect databases if technological measures and other things were not um, sufficient to do so. Um, and so we, we did feel vindicated, and I should say I think vindicated to this day in that if you look at what's available to consumers in terms of derivative databases, <coughs> downstream uses of data, um, how important data is to the information economy, that the fact that we don't have data best protection legislation has been good for consumers. Um, uh, so I, I feel that um, and ultimately our position was, was the right position uh, for the Internet ecosystem. And, and the non-event really was an important event. <laughs> And it, it, it falls to you to take us out of the story uh, to, to talk about how it all ended up and, and to offer, if you would, your views about why it ended, why, why we are still debating database protection in every session of Congress. Okay, well, let me, um, my fellow panelists have made some great points, and I do want to thank uh, Sean and uh, my special thanks for proof for over the years uh, for all the work uh, that was done. And it really was a coalition and a family fighting for what we all, I think, believed in our various ways for what was really in the public interest. Um, and um, go back a little bit, I think, to later foundation. Um, the tech industry, and, and Markham did some of the good description, um, was not a powerful industry. A nascent industry, naive about Washington, fearful and disrespectful a policy in Washington in many ways. A few companies exceptions, but basically um, it was, and, and the companies had many other interests, you think international trade, et cetera. So this issue was an issue that was on the radar screen for a few companies of a bigger industry, and even for those companies, for most of them, it was only one of a series of issues. Nevertheless, at the end of the day, I think the involvement of the tech industry was a critical factor in the political calculation of various players that it was a difficult fight to continue. The public interest groups had done a great job, had, done, had fought hard, um, but I do think the financial um, interests on the other side felt on an ongoing, for many years, they had the upper hand and they would eventually prevail, just keep coming back. I think someone to go to, Last part of your question, Peter, I think there was a fundamental recognition that the new players on the field helping the nonprofit world were going to make a, an easy victory difficult. And they had other battles to fight, and, and, and we moved on, and we have, still have innumerable copyright battles going on. Um, but I think the change of political perception of the players, plus and I think, again, what Marco mentioned is some of the arguments that there was going to be ca catastrophic results if they didn't get it, well, after not getting it for seven or eight years, and you don't have catastrophic results, it's hard to keep making that argument. And eBay in particular, who's now for many years been one of my great members, was not, at the, and was very mad at us for a long time, um, because they, did, they were arguing how critical it was to have this protection. And they kept thriving. And, and their ability to go on the hill credibly and make that pitch was, was just uh, difficult after a while. And so while there are other players entered the field from the other side, there also was a withdrawal of some players who had been deeply involved um, and, and effective players uh, on the other side. Um, a little bit of sense of, of the uniqueness of this industry, of my tech industry getting involved. Um, pat us on the back a little bit. There really is within the industry a lot of folks who believe the mission of the industry is a good one for the public. That we provide access to information, allow information to be analyzed, and that knowledge and wisdom to be disseminated. And protecting that was not just for many people in the industry, just a matter of a business model. It was really a belief that, you know, what we're doing in this industry is good, and there are people who are trying to clamp down on it and limit it and restrict it. Um, are 
worth fighting because they're really um, letting a their perception of their interests and we would say maybe extreme claims and excessive greed um, threaten the the good body politic. Um, and that was that remains a a factor because at different times when people were busy and other issues and wanting to escape, you know, did, did not fight this battle anymore, um, being able to remind people that the value of the system that did that, that maintained without the, the, the non event um, was very important. Um, and mixed with that was uh, and again we talked about DMCA. Um, DMCA preceded and lasted and and the immediate years after passage went through this uh, period of the database. We witnessed claims from whites holders. Well, cash every everything cashed, every copying of a of a laptop, every time you did a document, I, everything was going to be protected. So the extreme claims of copyright interests um, scared people. They were they did it to mobilize their side of how if in fact they didn't have these controls, well everything would be free and pirate and everything. But it also made a lot of people who were not going to pay attention recognize that the, the concept of a toll booth in essence, at every step of the internet movement of, of knowledge and documents was going to be um, an obstacle. Uh, it, so I would honestly say one of the great things that, that happened was the constant greed and excess of claims on the other side kept reigniting uh, interest in our side and let us play what I call the Paul Revere role. So we would go to companies, I see Sarah here, and you know, the Bell companies had tremendous interest in lots of issues, big issues. Um, she was one who helped carry the message. That you guys ought to care about this too, uh, to, to, to companies. And it and it wasn't obvious um, for for telecom companies. It wasn't obvious for other categories of companies how much um, their interests were potentially affected if there was a loss in this area. Um, and so, I really I credit what we did greatly. But I sometimes you really do have to thank your enemies for the way they sometimes overreach. Um, and I, I really do think that's a critical part to understand. Um, the other thing I guess I'd say about the tech industry um, and how it, both in copyright and general in this area is people, right now we have tremendous battles on copyright, on patents, on trademarks. Much of the early industry and the people who really were leaders in the innovation industry weren't hung up a whole lot on protecting their knowledge. They shared. They shared wildly. It was open. It was a free exchange. It was, how do we make something better? Um, not everybody, but it was part of the culture. And that early cultural aspect of the tech industry, again, fed in, that was their practical. They, they saw the exchange of information in the public domain context as pro-innovation. So again, it wasn't just good for them from a business model, but it was actually a, a good in general as a, a way to proceed. And so there were, we had, even though it wasn't always a high priority, I could always find, often find, some people in some companies to whom you could kind of go to and say, look, remember why this is important. Um, and we were able to stay in the game, although I clearly I had members who were not, who had other priorities who were not always on the same side of this. But we had been committed to um, fostering a climate which is not just for the our, in the interest of our industry, but the interest of our industry's customers and users. And the public interest part of our our history as an institution, our historical um, culture, um, and it, it, it let us stay in the game. And one last reference is Yahoo again was a critical player, and I lost my general counsel to Yahoo in, after this fight. <laughs> <laughs> So I want to I want to open up the the floor pretty quickly. But before I do, I wondered whether any of any of my wonderful panelists wanted to to extend or or correct their remarks or to respond to a question that someone else received rather than themselves, or other, to make any other observations about what this made. 
what made this struggle both an unusual and and successful. One thing that strikes me is that it was one of the very first instances of which I'm aware um, the, the copyright wars around the DMCA that we're going to hear about in our next panel being, being the other, what might be called a kind of broad-based or miscellaneous <coughs> coalition being assembled around an, an IP protection issue. This had not been a, a classic mode of advocacy in the field, and it became one much more so, and I think to some extent, and we'll hear about that in our later panels today, continues to be one, in, in part because of the, the, the kind of proof of concept that both the database struggle and the struggle around the DMCA <laughs> offered. So I would, I, would, I, would, I would add that to the, to the, the lessons learned part. But who, who would like to say something more? Miriam. <clears throat> well, building on that, Peter, um, I, think, <clears throat> I think one of the things that helped as that as coalition work is that we showed up as a coalition players were coming and going but we were showing up for visits with members on the hill all the time so we would have our um, many of our strategy meetings at ARL um, but we had a committed group of people. You did not have to worry if someone was going to show up to represent <clears throat> the tech industry or, um, or others because <clears throat> people were there. We were committed. And we had these really practical examples. We had the public interest arguments. But more importantly, we showed up. And when you had an array of individuals representing these organizations, businesses, consumers, <clears throat> who would explain? Uh, maybe one reason uh, database protection became a non-event is that the congressional staff just thought, we cannot have one more year <laughs> of all these people coming and <clears throat> and making these arguments. Um, but it worked. And I think it was real dedication, commitment, and we really believed in what we were doing. Others? Yeah. Uh, I, well, I, I just had one, one quick note as to the breadth of the coalition, because they just seemed to be very critical. Um, the Chamber of Commerce had a robust debate internally as to what to do about this. They ended up coming in very, very powerfully on our side of the argument. Uh, Tom Donahue, the, the head of the chamber, testified uh, before Congress on this. They key voted this. What that means is the vote on this issue played into uh, uh, members' rating from the chamber. <clears throat> generally, key note vote maybe 12 issues a year. They generally are issues of the magnitude of budget votes, minimum wage, major health care reform, and then this. And to their credit, at that time, I th it was really a very forward-looking thing for them to do, because certainly, uh, apropos of, of Ed's commentary, that, that the industry, the tech industry, was in certain ways nascent at that time. This was a, a, ga a, a gamble on what the world was going to look like and what American business was going to look like in 10 or 15 years. And to, you know, I just wanted to, to give all credit to them for having arrived at that conclusion. And again, they were enormously important to the, to the happy ending to the story. Particularly with the realtors on the other side. Correct, because you had the realtors, the AMA, you had a host of other big sort of traditional Republican lobbying forces on that side, and the chamber being able to come in and neutralize that 
uh, a bit was enormously helpful and again something that I think was was indicative of a, a very forward-looking approach for them because you could have made the case to them based on their membership based on the range of things they had to worry about that this was not something they should be expending any calories on they expended a lot of calories on. Yeah. You have a question here. Well, should we go to questions? It's up to you. Up to questions. Let me, if, 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 unless you had something further, Ted, we could go to questions. Well, I, something, sorry, I mean, did, this is particularly striking. I came, I, I came to this as an antitrust lawyer. I was counterclaims in copyright cases on phone books, basically saying if we stole anything, you had a legal right to give, legal obligation on the antitrust law to give. So I had a somewhat skeptical view of intellectual property. Total ignorance. What I realized quickly is that there are a lot more lawyers in the copyright side on the claimant's side than on the defendant's side. There's no copyright defense bar. Patent lawyers have to play both sides. The organized bar was entirely set up around the, the same thing that's true of the lobby. That the, the folks who had an organized access to members and to these issues were all the, the plaintiff's side. And so it was quite striking that this group sort of formed an ad hoc opposition of considerable force on the other side. It was a typical, I think, my, what I hear for intellectual property disputes. Can I just uh, elaborate or underscore that point and, and, and sort of uh, elaborate in the following way? A, a couple of people have mentioned that the other side struggled to come up with good policy reasons for uh, the law. And I think it's because they've never really had to do that prior to this, in that you're right. Um, their copyright is an arcane part of the law. Uh, it's it, it's the, the people on the Hill that know copyright were maybe two staffers on House and Senate, maybe a little bit more generous. Uh, the other side had uh, John Baumgarten, who's the former general counsel of the Copyright Office, very well respected by those rights holders and the Copyright Office, which the Copyright Office was on the other side. Um, and so you had members who just naturally thought, well, if the Copyright Office, the expert agency, so to speak, in the administration thinks there's a gap, and John Baumgarten does, and these rights holders and the Judiciary Committee, they were just sort of naturally inclined to not think too hard about whether it was a good policy. Um, in addition, it was really before the advent of social media where things that were happening at the subcommittee or committee level, the Judiciary Committee, could get a lot of um, public discourse in a fast way. And so things would happen and no one would know about them. So there wasn't a lot of pressure on members to do things that were in a, in a super transparent way. So I think a lot of that has changed for the better. Uh, maybe not all the way, but, but they were in a closed loop system. And we were really the skunks at the party. Damn proud. <laughs> um, with, with, uh, let's go to questions. Pat. I, I'm just so curious about who brought in the Chamber of Commerce. Um, I think it's fair to say John Schreibel, who uh, a wonderful person alluded to earlier, who had uh, worked at CCIA and, and went to Yahoo. Yahoo and Bloomberg were both Chamber members, and, but as was uh, AT&T, who was uh, here, and I think it's fair to say probably we were the three primary proponents within the chamber arguing that they ought to get that why they ought to do this. But however, I would I would again say our arguments were prospective, which is to say you're going to be harming what this ecosystem looks like in the years ahead. And you know, all, generally a prospective, you're going to be harming the ecosystem in the years ahead. Uh, doesn't trump a what's the gun pointed at my temple today? And to their credit, they looked ahead in terms of what kind of ecosystem they wanted to have in the space. To carry that exactly correct, the tech industry members, uh, companies that joined places like the chamber and NAM, were not huge players there, and but they had they were new players. And remember, we are talking the '90s here, and we. It was clear that the tech industry was going to grow. So I'm actually right. surprised also in a way that the chamber did do that. But they did see this was a future growth issue. The other thing that I think was important for the chamber and on the Hill is um, 
I hate to say this, but ignorance was wonderful. <laughs> they didn't understand the tech industry. And so when the people from tech industry and library industry talking about the arcane world of copyright, kind of has an expertise that people kind of, okay, you know. So we, again, people trying to get something past, change the status quo to a change, people felt uncomfortable leaving the status quo because they weren't sure, even if they were tempted by some of the arguments, to go in a change direction. And I think the confidence of a coalition that would show up with the diverse members of the coalition all echoing each other, well, if all these different people kind of think this, I don't really understand this that much, so maybe we just better hold off. And I think that, that was a mentality that was important, and it was also a mentality why the chamber, um, I think, was also not willing to get into something that had potential unknown consequences for many of its members. I'd also add to that, and it, it just quickly, the, the, you might find yourself asking why in the world would you try to pass legislation to overcome a Supreme Court decision that was rendered on additional grounds? Do that. Well, the answer is you pass legislation that has lots of vague terms and lots of penalties and then you just scare the hell out of people, and it would have the chilling effect. Nobody's going to go in and compete with an archival database holder if there's a chance they are buying a massive lawsuit. And certainly, I think the chamber was sensitive as a practical matter. Um, and in fact, if you look, go back and look at Tom Donahue's testimony, it's fabulously practical. He says, you know, I got a lot of database producers, and none of them are telling me that they can't protect their data. But what I'm seeing is a lot of vague terms that are going to be litigated. That's not good. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so I think that you know, was part of the, and, and you'll see this frequently, where uh, it, it makes it hard to fight sometimes because you're fighting with mush, but the mush is, if there are vague terms you're going to have to litigate forever, that changes the, the balance in terms of what areas you want to compete in, what investments you want to make, and, and that's not a positive. Those of you who are wondering how, if this started as a fight with the phone companies, how did AT&T end up on our side? The answer is because at the time, AT&T was a technology company, not a telephone company. We had broken up the company, and Southwestern Bell hadn't bought the trademark back yet. And so uh, it was not a wireline telephone company. So the wireline telephone companies, the seven divested companies, were on the other side because they were protecting their yellow papers directory businesses. AT&T, a technology company. That explains a seeming anomaly. Sarah. I'm, I'm just wondering, do you remember some specific models of unintended consequences? That, you know, what, what did you give as kind of the example of what would come out of that? I'm happy to give you two that are off the top of my head. One, in our case, okay, Bloom, Bloomberg uh, creates analytics to analyze the financial market. Under this legislation, conceivably, you could the New York Stock Exchange would own the fact that IBM sold for 100 bucks a share on a given date. The way that the legislation was drafted, we would have had to go to the New York Stock Exchange and seek permission in order to make, say, an analytic <coughs> comparing how different computer companies had fared over a period of time. Uh, because if we were going to use factual data, and it was in an area that conceivably they could have developed the product, we needed to go get their permission in order to do it. Um, that, obviously, the idea of going and having to seek uh, permission from a potential competitor uh, for any product you develop was an unattractive track for us. Uh, one other more, more uh, aimed at the sports page than the business page, uh, we analyze, we had the, the thought, which actually David Ignatius, I think, cited in an op-ed in an, an op on this. Um, Ted Williams, the splendid splinter, Teddy Ball game, before he was frozen into suspended animation. <laughs> he, back when he was most famous for being the last of the 400 hitters. Let's say he had decided that he was going to write his autobiography. Well, under this legislation, Major League Baseball would have owned the fact that he hit 406 in 1941. Does should Teddy Ballgame be precluded from writing his own autobiography 
because he doesn't own the fact or is not permitted to use the fact that he hit 406 in 1941. Most people, whether they care about baseball or not, find that to be in some way an unsatisfactory outcome. And that's, and that's a little easier to understand than the concept of <clears throat> research and scholarship is going to be irreparably harmed, which we firmly believed. And that's something that everybody can in concept understand. But the Ted Williams thing always seemed to work really well. <laughs> As a rule of thumb, we're going to give you some free advice here. If you're walking into a congressional office and your choice is complicated quantum mechanics example or baseball example. <laughs> no baseball. Examples <laughs> <laughs> made them all kinds up. They were great. They... No one in town was better at that. Than yeah. Coming up right. with that, that, that simple, absolutely accurate. Being a simpleton is the first step of getting there. <laughs> I've always admired it. <laughs> Yes. Uh, thanks. I just wanted to note that I think that the general science community um, also is a strong supporter of the same view. When I was at the National Science Foundation at the time, and I know hosting uh, the uh, data day presentation, and I was the legislative liaison to the Office of Management and Budget, so I had an opportunity to present my agency's views um, to OMB in terms of implementing the uh, amendments of the administration. Of course, we're only one agency weighing in. But that is another way that the scientific community has really worked with me here in the library community. And um, after that, I, I worked with the library and the student community at the local level with the Mindy Society and also on traditional knowledge issues. So I, I just really want to make the point that I think in the human library science community, we have tools to work together with very similar viewpoints. And um, so we were, we were part of this struggle as well. And um, Anyway, just uh, I thank all of you for all the work that you do. Here, winning leads losing, and also I'd say we, you know we're sitting up here, but on any issue like this, this is the proverbial: you're opening the ketchup, and who's the last guy to twist isn't necessarily the guy who actually got the thing open. I mean, there were so many people who were so important to this, uh, and, and including the National Science Foundation. Yes. Jim, uh, I'm blank, blanking on his last name now, but. Uh, Jim Jensen, Jepson, something along. Ah, right. Jim Jensen. Jim Jensen. I nailed the name and missed the organization. Okay. But no, lots of people, and thank you. Another question or two. Hurry. Um, I'm interested if the USPTO had any opinion. Did they engage at all in this legislation or? Mark, I'm smiling. <laughs> well, I would say there wasn't any daylight between the USPTO and the Copyright Office. And in fact, it was the commissioner of the PTO who was very engaged in Europe in the passage of the database directive. In fact, that is a sort of a well-worn strategy, which is to try to get something done in Europe in the space where the publishers are a strong <clears throat> constituency, or a very strong constituency. and then come back to the United States and argue that one needs to have um, harmonization. Uh, but uh, as I recall, they were um, uh, uh, totally in the camp of the uh, rights holders. Yeah, the run-up to yeah, the... everything else. Yeah, but, but then, <laughs> but, but I think, I think no. later, I mean, that, that's true. Yeah, I think that that was right in the, uh, in, in the, in the WIPO context, but then later on, the the commerce department was you know the commerce department you know which of which the PTO is a part became very helpful and I'm thinking you know both Justin Hughes and Andy Pincus uh, later on became really helpful in really sort of doubting the constitutionality of the legislation and they came out with uh, uh, if my, my recollection is that the, the ultimately the, the statement of administration position was skeptical uh, of, of the legislation so they. Uh, you know, it's like th this thing lasted long enough <laughs> that, that different agencies took different uh, different uh, positions over time. But but again, they were just you know to go to Anita's point, and there were a lot of cooks uh, that were part of this uh, this mix. You know, I I adverted at the outset to the fact that this this struggle was going on on multiple fronts, and during all the the months and, and years that 
from from Congress to Congress, the the issue was joined here. There was also this discussion taking place in Geneva. The the new WIPO treaties, which were slated to be to be which, which well, which were finally uh, uh, agreed on and signed in 1996. There were two, but originally there had been three. Um, there was a copyright treaty and a performances and performers treaty that came through the WIPO process. There was a database treaty that did not. If you read the official commentary of WIPO, they would say, oh, we ran out of time. Um, that's not the whole story, as many people in this room can state. In effect, uh, they ran out of time because it would have taken months and years to get to success because the resistance was so strong. So what you've heard today is something quite precious because none of what you've heard today has ever been written. I'm not sure it ever will be written. Um, this story of the, well, there is this possibility because William is with us. But this, this story of the, the signal non-event of copyright and IP policy making of the 1990s is an unwritten story. Um, we've had in our panel today the, the materials for making the beginnings of a narrative of the, the domestic side of the story. There's a whole additional narrative which we don't have time or space for today but which a number of the people in the room I see could contribute to for telling the international side of the story. So uh, I hope that we consider this to be a, a first draft of a, a, an account, a retrospective account of this, this remarkable non-event. Peter? Yes. You kind of closed the book on this. Please. Let me suggest it's really not closed. There are ongoing efforts. We have ancillary copyright concepts that are basically carrying on the same underlying principle, trying to put it in. The, the privacy debate is very complicated, but there are concepts in the privacy mm -hmm. debate, which again, the ownership of facts and data about people who controls them, what can be done. So we really did a tremendous amount closing that specific set of battles. But the ideas that spark some of these problems are unfortunately alive and well and living in different sets of clothing. That's a very, very important and a very sobering note on which to close this panel. Thank you all very, very much. And uh, great. I, I see no schedule break before our DMCA panel. So I think that the DMCA group should come down and anyone who who wants to leave the room does so at their own risk. Uh, because this is going to be another great set of stories. It's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs>
at least in my world, the EU direction had exactly the opposite effect. Because at that time, there was still a very strong xenophobic response. Well, plus Elsevier is a European is a Dutch company. I, I remember that. I mean, I remember among the other lines we were arguing was, you know, what American companies are asking. Remember they talked about the directive, they talked about static law, yeah. you know, codification of things. Right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But, I, but I, I have a distinct memory of sitting in one of the house hearing one of the house meeting rooms and we were all kicking around but I don't remember what we were negotiating because there was no building negotiating. One of the guys we thought was going to be the guy to do it in the Senate, yeah. Mike DeWine. Oh no no no! Maybe more now. Were you in the? Were you one of the ten DMC negotiators? We were trying to recreate the room. I don't think you were in the room. Right? You know the one that uh, that Hatch. You know when Hatch put ten of us into a room and said, "Don't come out until you have a deal." Uh, so two, I think you were. I think you were in the group that met at you know among yeah. the copyright owners. And then I was in another room in the library where we were supposed to hammer out uh, the library provisions. Oh, in the DMC. Yeah. And, and later <coughs> they both stopped by and said, "Keep at it, keep at it. Got to stay here." Yeah. yeah. And then finally. Uh, 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 he's uh, being called. Uh, uh, it's not going to happen. Let them out. It was really a fascinating process. I'm sure everybody has a slightly different yeah. memory and yeah. emphasis yeah. on how yeah, things so went. So, so they, I mean, he was a staff I, I remember the DMCA negotiations really well. I, mean, that was, I was one of the ten, so was Sarah. No, I don't think anyone else here was. I was so exhausted at the Yeah. I was asleep with the water. Remember, it was the when we were talking about the knowledge there. Yeah. Coming with that. Should have, would have, could have. Right. Oh, no, I, I remember those, those discussions. Um, Start in a minute. We were happy with the library, you know, the library edition to the DMC. I thought that could have been done better. We, we did the we did. Yeah, but we mostly did the teach out. So it's together. brand new. Yeah. And I think so we're pretty close to Charles because also. I don't want him to feel like. And I still think that gets a bad rap. Um, yeah. Continuing policy role. Um, if there's seats, please, we're going to keep the program not, moving. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, good afternoon. Um, so uh, I am Michael Carroll. I'm on the faculty, one of uh, uh, the IP faculty and Peter's uh, colleague and, and trying to do my best to uh, sort of uh, continue with that excellent and uh, important unwritten history that we just heard about. Um, I believe the protocol here is the bios have already been distributed, so we don't need to uh, introduce everybody. Um, in terms of framing our, our conversation, the focus will be on um, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and the policy advocacy that went into that um, on the public interest side. Um, and there are a lot of ways to start that conversation and to frame it. Certainly the white paper we'll hear about, but I don't want to start just with the white paper because um, <clears throat> I think that's too narrow a focus. Um, now my own personal history in this is um, chronologically I belong in an earlier generation, but as a lawyer I actually started law school in 1993, which happens to be one of the most momentous moments in the history of, of the internet. So I was 
when I was a first year law student, I knew the internet was going to be the next big thing and I wanted to be part of it. And I was either going to be a telecom lawyer or a copyright lawyer, but those were the choices. And obviously I ended up choosing the copyright side, but um, I had followed these issues previously um, working with geeks. And I just want to point out that there were a variety of policy decisions that preceded the debate we're about to hear about that often aren't part of the DMCA story, but I think they ought to be. Um, because there were part of what this uh, policy issue was about was sort of governing a network that had a particular architecture that was deemed to be threatening to the interests of copyright holders because of its properties. But there was nothing inevitable about that being the set of properties. If you go back to you know, the, the preceding sort of landmark watershed moment. So 1983, the TCPIP protocol is developed and adopted for the ARPANET, which is the predecessor of the internet. This is a protocol that allows the network to be open and decentralized. It doesn't have to speak anybody's pr proprietary language. It's an open protocol. Tim Berners-Lee then comes up with the HTTP protocol that gives us uh, an open protocol for anyone to use the World Wide Web. So these are developments taking place in the, in the 1980s. Um, <clears throat> the ARPANET is a Defense Department-run research network. Um, the National Science Foundation then starts the CSNet, in which members of computer science departments can uh, interact with each other. CSNet also adopts this open protocol, so now ARPANET and CSNet can talk to each other. <laughs> Uh, and suddenly we have the, the germs of the internet. We have uh, a scale-free network that anyone can join uh, as long as you're speaking the internet language, which is this TCPIP network. Um, the, as the, in 1990, the Defense Department steps back. The National Science Foundation remains the administrator of this network, and the pressure starts to build as more and more people join it, asking why the US government is paying full freight for a network that really could be commercialized, could be open to players, and commercial players are knocking at the door saying, we want to be part of this too. Um, add to that then an election in 1992, two young ambitious politicians, uh, President Clinton and Vice President Gore, with their eyes on the future, uh, enter the political arena at this moment where the potential for this network is part of their policy mm -hmm. agenda. And so we, uh, we have pressure to commercialize, um, and rather than commercialize by handing off control of the, of the operation of the network to AT&T or IBM, in which case the copyright policy issues might have been played out differently if you had a monopoly communications provider. Instead, the desire was let's keep this decentralized network architecture and let that become the private sectors. Uh, that's the way the internet's going to work. So. So if that's the way the internet's gonna work, then we get the National Information Infrastructure, the NII. So here comes the, the Washington alphabet soup. If we're gonna layer policy on top of this decentralized network, what's that policy framework gonna look like? So we start with the National Information infra Infrastructure. We're gonna have broad policies for, that are gonna lay, lay out the roadmap. Within that, we are going to have the Information Infrastructure Task Force, the IITF, which will oversee uh, all of these different areas, including intellectual property, privacy, telecommunications, uh, and access to government information. Within the IITF, there will be the Information Policy Committee, and under the Information Policy Committee is the Intellectual Property Working Group. You got that? <laughs> okay. So, the so that working group um, is then tasked with think, looking at how intellectual property is going to function on this inf information infrastructure. And although all four branches of intellectual property are represented in the, both the green and the white paper, uh, copyright is at center stage. Cop copyright gets most of the text. Copyright gets the proposed legislation. Um, and although this is chaired by the Assistant Secretary for Commerce and the chair, head of the Patent and Trademark Office, this is really about copyright. Um, and the Department of Commerce is sort of being primed to be the, the lead government agency um, in, in going forward. So we get the green paper, which is the draft report that 
proposes a series of changes to copyright law to bring it uh, up to date according to one view about what, what, what is needed. This decentralized network is, is positioned in the green paper and then the white paper as a potentially promising environment for the uh, dissemination of copyrighted works, but in its, in its current state, a threatening environment because uh, information can be freely copied. There are no central points of control um, and intermediaries that can be controlled and without uh, new policies that provide additional rights, particularly about transmission of, uh, of copies across the internet and then uh, protection for digital locks that are put on the content not being picked and not having uh, a, a market in, in the lock picks. Uh, and so we do end up getting a white paper in 1995 that has proposed legislation that says uh, it's a threatening environment, but it can be tamed. These are the changes that need to be made. Um, and we see the germs of Title I of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which is now Chapter 12 of the copyright uh, section, which deals with uh, technological protection measures. We don't see Title II in the white paper, which is about the, the uh, limitations on liabilities for um, internet service providers, because that's a separate legislative initiative that's going on. And, and what, what happens is a policy process that we are about to hear about in which sausage gets made, and at the very waning days of a Congress in 1998, a deal is struck between two uh, coalitions uh, representing different interests, and each side doesn't get everything they want, but they get some of what they want. And so that's our that's our setup, and I'm going to then um, turn it over to my uh, neighbor to the immediate left, John Band, to talk about uh, the Digital Future Co Coalition, what, it, what was that? How did it come together? What was its, what's the context? Uh, so thank you very much, and I'm excited to be here. Well, sad, sad that we're sort of celebrating, or sad that Prue's retiring, let's put it that way. Um, and, and the, and the, uh, but at the same time, uh, it's, it's been uh, you know, wonderful working with her, and, and uh, obviously everything that uh, we're talking about today uh, is is uh, uh, in one way or another a function of of, of her involvement. Um, so the, the the very short answer is I don't remember how the Digital Future Coalition came together. <laughs> it was a long time ago, and uh, you know, and and so so I, I guess I was a Peter whoever said before about the elders, and so um, uh, well certainly I wasn't one of the elders at the time, uh, you know, because it was you know. We're talking in the, the mid '90s, uh, so so I don't remember exactly how it came together, and I'm sure I know that Pat is working on a on a history of the of the Digital Future Coalition, and so hopefully she'll be able to provide the answer of exactly uh, the, the 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 exact impetus. Uh, and how, how we actually, and I was actually asking Bob, well, how did we The short sort of, course is success has many mothers. <laughs> exactly. But, but uh, just to, to go from what Michael was saying, I mean, there, there were basically uh, three big policy issues were sort of swirling around Washington in, in, the, in the copyright circles in the mid-90s. So you had uh, the, the database issue, which we just heard about. Uh, you had the... the Internet service provider liability issue, which which ultimately became Section 512, the safe harbors, which we'll also be talking about in, in a minute. Others will be talking about, and then there was Section 1201, the the technical protection measures provision. And so these were sort of three separate issues which were under discussion. Um, <clears throat> by far, the the issue that was getting the most attention was was the safe harbor, Section 512, and that's because. Uh, it was uh, of the great of great interest to uh, uh, the, the large uh, uh, telecommunications companies, which were moving into sort of providing internet access, uh, sort of like you know the the AT and T's and the Bill Atlantics uh, of the world, and so they just were much more experienced in Washington, had a much bigger footprint, and so. And the copyright owners also, I think, were much more on the whole focused on that discussion. So that was, that was like the big issue that got most attention. And then there were these two other issues that were getting much less attention. And so that was the, uh, the, the, the database directive 
uh, the, da the database legislation and and section 1201 the technical technological protection measures um, and uh, uh, now, now I was working more on those two uh, I, I really got involved with uh, the safe harbors only at the very end uh, but but I was working on these other two issues um, and we were on both the issues as, as we were working on them, but I mean, we were running into a lot of the same people um, working on those two issues. Uh, at some point, and I don't know whether it was more at Peter's initiative or Prue's initiative, or you know, again, Pat will say someone else's initiative, someone sort of suggested that we all start working together in a little bit more of a, a formal way. And so during the 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 period of, let's say, 96, 97, uh, the, the focus was much more probably still uh, on the Section 1201. So the, 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 this, this, this DFC, this Digital Future Coalition, came together. And I remember that, that uh, there, there was some event somewhere at, on the old campus, at uh, or the old law school, or, or somewhere on the main campus of uh, 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 of, of, of American University, and that there were um, lots of people brought in uh, from the uh, science community and the library community, but as well as uh, uh, industry groups, um, and uh, we and that sort of formalized a process that was already going on informally in terms of working together on these issues. Uh, but again, as I said, mainly database and and Section 1201. Um, and uh, what was uh, now what was interesting about the DFC, of course, is that the the 1201 issue, in essence, we stopped really working on it after the DMCA was enacted. I mean, we you know, because we, we we started we, we continued to work together a little bit with respect to. Um, Issues like uh, the the exemptions, the rulemaking process uh, for 1201, uh, uh, but but the focus then shifted more towards database because that just that issue just kept on going. We also started working on UCTA, uh, the uh, uni uh, the Uniform Computer Information Transactions Act, um, but but I but I think the the what's what's Critical about the success of the coalition was that, uh, and again, we heard in sort of like the biggest success was uh, was sort of preventing database legislation from going forward, uh, but also <coughs> with respect to uh, with respect to um, with respect to the the, um, the the section 1201 process, as we'll hear more, it could have been worse, and so. So yeah, I think I think we made uh, you know 1201 was better than it otherwise would have been, but for uh, the, the coalition's involvement. But the the critical factor was uh, twofold. One was that uh, you did have this alignment of both uh, for-profit and non-profit entities, and so uh, and and both sides, both the for-profit and non-profit, really. Cared about these issues and really were willing to work together uh, uh, in lockstep on on these issues, and and that. But, but related to that is that there was an unusual degree of trust uh, uh, between these sectors. Again, historically, these sectors don't always work together well because there's a degree of suspicion or distrust. Um, but we were able to work together. Uh, and I think uh, again, the, a, a large a large part of that is is Prue. I mean, she was able to really sort of uh, keep us all focused, and and just by by virtue of her personality, um, was able to sort of foster an environment of of transparency and trust and cooperation that may not otherwise. Uh, we might not otherwise have had, and that that by by doing that at the very beginning, sort of getting off on that right foot back then, it, it's why we're able to still all work together now, uh, uh, you know, twenty plus years later. Um, so I think that 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 level of uh, cooperation uh, is very important. The other point related to that, uh, and it's too bad that I saw Greg leave, Greg Babiak, but 
you know, we, we, what, what was said before in the previous panel, I mean, we really did have a good time, and we still do have a good time. Uh, Berg's a really funny guy. Um, but, but it's, it's uh, uh, the, the um, there is this sense of we, we actually all really get along. And that a part of it is also, again, the, the tone that Prue set, that we're not, uh, you know, yes, we, we are working together, but that it's, you know, we're, we end up spending a lot of time together, and we might as well enjoy ourselves uh, while we're spending all this time together. And so that has also been a critical uh, function or a critical factor in the ongoing success of, of sort of like this, uh, you know, even though the, the Digital Future Coalition no longer exists per se, I mean, it's sort of its spirit continues, and we still do all work together uh, on various issues 20 years later. And I think, again, that's ultimately, uh, in many, in, in large measure, a tribute to, uh, to Prue. Great. So um, one other thing that um, uh, Prue Adler is known for is she, she worked at the Office of Technology Assessment, which was an, an office that was supposed to educate the U.S. Congress about technology and technology issues. And... It got disbanded, and that's not part of our main theory and story here, but it's an issue then. Without an OTA, Bob, let me ask you, um, how well educated did you find the, the, the members of Congress uh, about uh, this, this new internet thingy that we were going to regulate? And... I couldn't have written a better question myself, I thought. Uh, let me start about the coalition. Uh, when I walked, you know, we heard on the first panel about, you know, love and family. When I walked in downstairs, and I, saw, I see these people, like John, I see a lot of these people from time to time, but I saw all together. Uh, Prue, and Miriam, and Sarah, and Miss Joseph, you know, got from John, who I see all the time, and Peter, who I see a fair amount. They just all together, I started choking up. And I ain't been right since. I can, I can only say that I, I hope the people on channel four, uh, on, uh, on panel number four in 20 years can look back and say the same thing. <laughs> and, and frankly, I feel the same way about some people who are on the other side in a lot of these uh, things. Because in negotiating with them, sometimes you see them more often than you see your own <laughs> allies. So John Baumgarten has been mentioned, Fritz Attaway, Vice President, Motion Picture Association, Hillary Rosen, uh, you know, developed really lasting friendships with them, notwithstanding their being wrong most of the time. <laughs> so we start in uh, 1986 about technology. And really, members of Congress, for the most part, uh, you know, it, unless they have a technical background, it's a question of who they trust and who they're inclined to trust, which is often you know, based on who they represent, and how credible their representations are and how well they remain credible over time after the other side comes in and after you know, some facts get into the picture. So who recognizes what this is? And what the, this is a report from the National Bureau of Standards, now NIST, uh, August 1988, and I'll read what it says inside the front cover. The front cover illustrates the effect of the copy protection encoder on a segment of Barbara Streisand singing somewhere. The upper color spectrograph corresponds to the original recording. The dark streak through the otherwise identical lower spectrograph shows where spectral components have been removed by the encoder. Well, the technical side of the music industry, working with CBS Labs, which was then credible, uh, came up with a copy protection mechanism for cutting a notch supposedly above the spectrum of human hearing into the original music, so that no matter what the format would be later, an encoder could be built so that uh, it would be recognized based on a legislative mandate, and whatever instructions there were about further use would have to be followed. And this was credible enough that it was introduced <laughs> as legislation. Uh, but they would at least wouldn't tell the public, you know, meaning us, uh, how they built the encoder, how it worked, or what was in it. So. As somebody who's, you know, then just with the Home Recording Rights Coalition 
and allies. These were, you know, this was 1986, 1988, before the DFC. Uh, what do you do? Well, they <clears throat> promoted this. They wanted national public radio. Uh, and there was a broadcast saying, you know, listen to this great music, listen to how great it sounds. Nobody can never notice that it has this encoding. Well, uh, through some family uh, <clears throat> uh, connections of Mr. Greenstein here, it turns out we knew people at National Public Radio, including their chief engineer, Skip Deason. So with a suitcase size uh, Sony uh, prototype digital audio tape recorder, I went over to the library at National Public Radio, uh, and we made a dub of their library tape. And another part of this coalition also, you know, within the tech world, used this dub of the tape to reverse engineer the filter. And then we went to congressional hearings and had, uh, you know, aside from, uh, from what was then CEA, or Consumer Electronics Manufacturers Association, uh, we had David Granada, the technical editor of Stereo Review, do some tests based on this reverse engineered built encoder that we had and we testified. And then it became time to lobby and what we wanted was uh, a reference to uh, an independent authority, the National Bureau, National Bureau of Standards as it then was, to do a test. And for this purpose, uh, ultimately, uh, each side put up some money to pay for this test. But how, do we, how did we get to the letter? There were two letters requesting this. One was from Bob Kastenmeier, copyright champion, and Dennis DeConcini on the Senate side, who is also very sympathetic to home recording, going back to what we'll, Michael will talk about later, the, B, the BCR wars. And also on the, on the House side, it was uh, from James Florio of New Jersey, the subcommittee uh, chairman who reported to John Dingle, and Bill Dannemeyer. Bill Dannemeyer represented Orange County, not exactly a high-tech uh, guy, and he was the ranking member. So it fell to yours truly to lobby Mr. Dannemeyer. Come in to talk about you know, this crazy idea. I said, you know, Mr. Dannemeyer, it, it, it's really unfortunate that they're choosing to do this to their own music. Now that we have this wonderful means of presenting it, the compact disc. He said, what's a compact disc? <laughs> well, uh, it, 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 it takes the music you know, using computer type technology and it preserves it in a way where you, you get a lot more music and it, it's not going to be uh, you know, subject to scratches or anything because it's recorded by, by digital means. What's a digital? <laughs> well, you see, when you have sound, it makes a sine wave. And it's possible to measure the area under the curve of the sine wave. And if you sample this 64,000.1 times a question, you can store this information in a computer and you can reproduce it in a way that will be absolutely reliable. It won't be subject to distortion, which you'll get over time with analog. What's an analog? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here's the problem I had in college. I didn't solve it the same way. You've got a kitchen table. It's got only three legs. It's missing a leg. You have to shore up the table. So, you know, so it wouldn't fall down. You'd put a bunch of books underneath. But now I have to, have to cut the new leg for the table. So one way is you put your fingertips on the floor, you mark on the shoulder how high the table comes, you transfer this to a big thing of wood, you draw a pencil <clears> mark <throat> on it, then you get a saw and you cut it off. That's analog. <laughs> <laughs> or, I know I'm holding the table up with books. I've got so many books, I know how many. It's got so many covers, I know how thick they are. They've got so many pages, I know how thick they are. You feed all this information into a computer and it cuts the table leg for you. That's digital. And he said, oh, well, why didn't you say that in the first place? This is the worst <laughs> piece of legislation I've ever heard. Of course I'm with you. This is a true story. <laughs> so 
the perspective, you know, everybody came to this with their own perspective. The perspective that, you know, we and the high tech guys have was also very blinkered. This is a chart that I drew at the time in uh, September 16th, 1998, right? In, in the time of final passage. And tried to put everything on one page as to what all the you know, interrelationships, concerns, and characteristics are. Uh, the, the SEC and the Telecom Act, uh, what was happening at WIPO, uh, the legislation we were working with, for, that we worked with for uh, with, with the movie industry that it turned out the computer industry didn't like, uh, HDTV broadcast, which was just starting there, the FCC, direct satellite, and all of that. You'll notice that even though we knew something about the internet and uh, you know what was happening there, there's nothing here but user-generated content. Because in the part that was the at the, that time, the Consumer Electronics Association and that industry, we were kind of like uh, Sheldon Leonard, the bartender in its A Wonderful Life. Uh, we make machines, we sell machines, and we want to get them to market fast. So the, que the big question for us was technological protection measures. And this was a question, and you know, but Seth will talk about the WIPO process. It, it, in the first round of all of this with the with the hearings when it was the green paper we did a pretty good job of raising a lot of questions uh, uh, about technological mandates and uh, their consequences it was probably fairly similar to the database thing. Uh, after wipo uh, the coalition did such a good job at wipo uh, that uh, we, w we could credibly claim that nothing was necessary in the DMCA, but uh, you know, members of Congress took another view. Uh, and if anybody asks, I can go into who are, the, who, are the guy, who are the folks who got it, who are the folks who just wanted to do what content said. But the questions were, you know, what's an effective technological measure? Is there going to be a definition of technological measure itself? Uh, the way it all worked out is that uh, our recommendation to at least the folks on the HRC side was uh, there were too many compromises past the stuff that we negotiated. Uh, we've done the best we can with legislative history, but the best thing to do would be to kill this thing. Uh, then, and he said, but, but we probably don't have to worry because they'll never solve the uh, you know, the discussion that turned out to be 512 said so they're too far apart on that side, so, so nothing's going to happen. And then the late report well, uh, it looks like they have a compromise on the other side. So we could maybe we could still bring this whole house down, maybe we couldn't, but by and large, our coalition, the DFC, thinks they probably got a good deal here. So uh, we, let's just try to do the best we can. And, and I should say, especially to our, our younger policy professionals, that you know you can work in different kind of policy environments. And right now, people say Congress can't get anything done. And obviously, legislation is getting passed, but not at the rate. I mean, we are talking about a very fertile period for policy making. Things, although database didn't have legs, and, and although DMCA almost fell apart, there were a variety of pieces of legislation in this space that were moving forward. So. So, Sarah, prior to the DMCA conversation, we had the Communications Decency Act, and, and, and the telecommunications industry was faced with a lot of different sort of moving parts nationally and internationally. What was, from, from the, the seat that you had, what was your perspective and your industry's perspective on this DMCA deal as it was taking shape, and, and what was the sort of perspective that you brought to the table? Thanks. It's great to be here, and just want to myself today, not for Verizon uh, or anyone else, but at the time, I think it's important to remember that copyright was new to us. You know, we, the telecom so, uh, groups that you know today as the telecom industry uh, was disaggregated. We were essentially the phone company. So if you guys remember Lily Tomlin playing the operator, you know, Bell Atlantic, who I worked for, was best known for, you know, 
uh, is this the party to who I am speaking? <laughs> so we were the, the driest, dullest possible industry, and there were, we had no experience with copyright. Um, you know, I was one of the, I was the only copyright lawyer there. And so the white, uh, I guess it was the green paper at the time, came across my desk, and the line stood out that said, the best policy is to hold the service provider liable. And that, that line you know, really woke us up. And we got together. The first thing we did was get together with our industry. So I worked for the, they were called the Regional Bell Operating Companies uh, after the AT&T broke up. And there were seven of us, Bell South, Pacific uh, Telecom, Ameritech, uh, Bell Atlantic, Southwest Bell, Bell, et cetera. And these people knew even less about copyright. But uh, what they did know was the Hill. They had excellent lobbyists. and. Uh, a group of great people were assigned to this, actually a lot of women uh, who know how to get things done and had great relationships. Uh, and we also had uh, wonderful attorneys. We had Bruce Joseph working for us, uh, who I would highly recommend that you make sure he's on your side of a debate and not on the other. Uh, so uh, the, the other, and then we started to meet the other players in the ecosystem. So. We got together with AT&T and MCI and uh, some of these rogue startups like AOL and Prodigy and uh, the ISPs and Prue and Miriam and Adam and CCIA. It was a great, interesting mixture. I don't think any of us had ever worked or known each other before. All we knew was that this thing was going to hold us liable. The internet would shut down and we had to work together. And we figured out how to do that pretty quickly. And, and it was really interesting because everyone had their own strengths and resources and brought the, and we were able to divide and kind of come to things that we need to work on. And then the, uh, the other interesting perspective is that uh, the telecom industry wasn't all on the same side of this issue. So for example, MCI, who ran the internet backbone, they really were concerned about 512A because they were a mere conduit. The Bell companies, we were really flipped out about caching because that was the technology we were using, and we couldn't imagine that you know, that could be declared illegal and we would be liable for it. So we concentrated on the B and the 512 B, C, and D, caching and, and linking. Um, but every, everyone had an educational role. And then, so we had the ad hoc copyright coalition. And then um, at some point, we were brought into a bigger group where we met the content industry. and. Don't forget, this was before, and now copyright seems, you know, we're here in a church slash temple Weinstein courtroom, and <laughs> the copyright has become this religion, but at the time, there, was no, there were no sides, right? Nobody took a side. All we knew is we had this problem, and it kind of morphed into one side or the other, but we were working through a difficult issue, so we, we met all of the content owners and were literally locked together in rooms uh, both before the DMCA negotiation and during the actual negotiation. where you know, Bruce and I were on the telecom side and, and several others. We had five on each side. And what was interesting about the negotiation, and they really turned into epic debates, we spent so much time with each other. I, I think we could each argue everyone else's point 10 times over because we knew. And, and we played an important educational role to teach each other how the technology worked, uh, to learn what the copyright concerns were, to brainstorm around solutions. Um, so it, it was a, an amazing experience. Um, oh, and the other thing I should mention is how did we get 512? I think because there would have been no DMCA unless that negotiation took place. We would definitely would have stopped the bill from happening. So we were in this kind of forced <laughs> negotiation, forced to compromise. And um, yeah, and I, I think that. That's basically the, the short story of how we got together. It's what Gail Collins of the New York Times calls the big messy deal, which is what a lot of legislation <laughs> was. Um, and have you guys sent um, Google and Facebook a bill for all the water you carried? <laughs> um, uh, great. So one of the things we heard about in the earlier uh, uh, panel and in terms of policy uh, issues that had legs, um, while things were going on in the United States, there was another stream of policy activity in the international in, in the intellectual property space, which had been the the merging of intellectual property and international trade policy that resulted in the TRIPS agreement, um, which was a wake up call for a body called the World Intellectual Property Organization, thought that thought its role was to shape international 
intellectual property policy. And suddenly the World Trade Organization now had jurisdiction over the most important intellectual property, international uh, intellectual property agreement. Um, and WIPO is not known for the speed at which it, it achieves consensus. Um, but, but suddenly uh, this process that had yielded the TRIPS agreement ends up happening right at the time when the internet is blossoming. And so this was a 1980s process that finally got finalized in, in 1994, 1995, uh, and the internet was nowhere to be seen in the copyright chapter. And so there was quickly an opportunity for WIPO to reclaim some space here, and there were various players that wanted to do that. So Seth, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the interaction between the WIPO treaties that Peter had mentioned uh, and the DMCA domestic policy debate. What I mean, was there a connection? Well, if I said no, there'd be a very short answer, but, <laughs> but the answer is absolutely. And uh, part of it goes to something that was also mentioned on the first panel, which is that there was this desire on behalf of the uh, United States and particularly a lot of United States um, copyright uh, industries to use international treaty negotiations, international policy as a way to triangulate so that you increase protection in other countries and then you have to bring it back to the United States and increase protection. And I guess I first started to see this when, uh, when well, Bob and Michael Petrico, when, this, when the Consumer Electronics Association, then known as the Electronic Industries Association, uh, sent me over to WIPO right around the time of the Audio Home Recording Act of 1992, which was kind of the first embodiment of a compromise piece of legislation that included some kind of technological protection measure along with some degree of royalty payment. And all of these issues were raging at WIPO. And uh, at that time, you know, there was a lot of discussion about a model copyright law, mm -hmm. uh, which was their uh, WIPO's main effort at the time. And it was moving very slowly, so slowly <coughs> that the, the chairman of these proceedings <coughs> Uh, Eukaliatis of Finland described it as mastodonic. I had never heard this word before, and hearing it from, uh, from a Finnish representative had to go look it up, but it was exactly apt. Um, so things were moving extraordinarily slowly. Um, and at the time, you know, there was this concern about photocopying machines, and then there was the analog VCR, and then suddenly there was the digital audio recorder, and uh, all of our companies certainly understood digital video recording was right around the corner, and there was this thing called the computer, which was you know, everybody thought of as a nice, sophisticated little you know, word processor or data processing mechanism, but everybody who was really thinking ahead understood was going to overtake all of this other stuff. And so uh, there was a representative from the publisher's community. His name is Charles Clark, who uh, spoke at WIPO, and his mantra was, the answer to the machine is in the machine. That there has got to be some way technologically to prevent all of the acts that we're concerned about. And it really gave rise to all of the things that you've heard, um, the non-paranoid concerns of everybody who's on this panel about how technology and innovation could have been stifled. So I started attending, and I saw some of this playing out, and how the United States then, uh, the Copyright Office taking the lead, was saying, well, you know, there are all these international norms and we're just going to have to bring the United States up to snuff. And, you know, the purpose of a treaty generally or the purpose of a model copyright law in some respects is, you know, to bring the developing nations up to international norms, get everybody on the same page. But also there is a desire to increase protections internationally. And so there was somewhat of a race between the EU uh, Jörg Reinbota for the EU, and uh, Bruce Lehman, who was the uh, commissioner of the Patent and Trademark Office, and had taken over all of the duties at WIPO of representing the interests of the United States. And his view, uh, and he was right, was that all of these nice little tweaks that WIPO was considering to the model copyright law and moving forward were going to be irrelevant in a matter of weeks. And what we really had to focus on instead was this thing that they called the digital agenda. And the digital agenda basically um, consisted of five separate rights. Inclusive rights that would be owned by the copyright owner, the right of reproduction, including K 
cash copies and every temporary reproduction that was made along the way, because even a momentary reproduction is a reproduction. A right of communication, by any means, this was kind of a means to bridge different uh, implementations of copyright policies and principles in the various legal systems around the world where some gave the right to broadcasters, some didn't have a right for broadcasters, some had you know, a right of publication, <laughs> some looked at distribution, some looked at it as communication. So if we just call it this one big umbrella thing, a right of communication, we can allow everybody to implement it as <clears throat> they wish, but of course this would be an exclusive right for, for the copyright owner. Obligations regarding rights management information, that is that you would have some digital encoding or indications of who the publisher was, whether it was subject to copyright, what the date was, and other information that could not be removed. And this would be, uh, a, again, an exclusive right owned by the copyright owner. There's the obligations regarding technological protection measures. That is, that if a copyright owner used a technological protection measure to protect its copyrighted works, you could not <clears throat> circumvent it, period, stop, end of story. And of course, there's also the question of whether limitations and exceptions that had been traditionally applied to copyrighted works, such as, you know, in Byrne, Article 9.2, would continue to persist into the uh, digital age, particularly because binary technology is binary. It's either yes or no, it's on or off. You know, where's the room for gray of fair use in the black and white world? So Bruce Lehman uh, pushed this agenda <coughs> along with Jörg Reinvota, uh, perceiving correctly that this was the future. These were the issues that really were going to matter in a broadband connected world. And you know, September of 1995, hours before it's released in the United States, um, boxes are being opened at WIPO and the white paper of the uh, Internet uh, Task Force, the, in, in, uh, Internet, the Infra, Information Infrastructure Task Force, technolo a working group on intellectual property, is being distributed to everybody in the room at WIPO. Uh, embodying the digital agenda and basically the United States sending the message along with the EU that the rest of the world ought to get on the bandwagon and ought to get with the program or else there will be consequences. And in the end, you know, I spent three weeks, I, I attended these meetings along the way, but I spent three weeks in Geneva in December of 1996 in what was lovingly called the bunker uh, <laughs> because of its architecture. I mean, it makes, it kind of makes, uh, the FBI building looked like Rococo <laughs> architecture. Uh, it gives new meaning to the, the phrase brutalist architecture, uh, because it was true on the inside as well as the outside. Uh, but mixed results came out. And as John said, if we weren't there, it could have been a lot worse. So in the end, it applied existing fair use limitations and exceptions going forward into the digital environment and allowed new limitations and exceptions that were consistent with the Byrne three-part test. It deleted the provision that would have given an exclusive right over all temporary reproductions, such as caching and memory of general purpose computers or uh, telecommunications networks or consumer electronics. It provided very importantly, again, <coughs> due to a lot of the work done by, by Sarah and her colleagues, that the communication right would not cover the mere provision of physical communications facilities. This is incredibly important and was incorporated in an agreed statement that went along with the treaty. The technological protection measures provision was enacted at a high level, which gave the nation's flexibility in application. So for example, a provision that tied technological protection measures of circumvention to infringement <coughs> would be permissible under the treaty. It's not the way that the DMCA reads, but that would be permissible under the WIPO treaty. And rights management information removal was protected only as to knowing alteration or deletions in order to enable or conceal infringement. And the reason that these things happened was largely because of the coalitions that you've been hearing about today. And you don't have to take my word for it. It's, it's absolutely true. I, I bring to you, actually, as kind of a tribute to, to Prue also and everything that, that Peter has done and others to, to put this coalition together, uh, the words of the Delegate, the head of the delegation to WIPO of India. His name is R. V. Iyer, and he wrote a piece back in, two, was published in November 2005 called Interest or Right, the Process and Politics of a Diplomatic Conference on Copyright. 
in the Journal of World Intellectual Property. And he wrote, another distinguishing feature of the interest group politics of the diplomatic conference was the intense participation of groups other than those of content providers. Aside here, it was actually the biggest revelation to a lot of the countries in the world that there were interests in the United States that, were, that thought differently than the copyright interests did. Because all they had heard from in their own countries was the copyright interest. All they had heard from, from the United States interests historically had been the copyright, uh, the copyright interests. Rightly so, they, their place was there. But the rest of us had a place there as well. Continuing. The digital agenda stirred up access providers, manufacturers of electronic hardware and consumer electronics, and fair use groups of librarians and researchers. The eagerness of the United States to assuage concerns about fair use, liability of access providers, and technological measures stems directly from interest group politics. If eventually the digital agenda was toned down and the database treaty not pressed, it is not a little due to interest group politics. Interesting. Thank you very much. Um, so, Michael, we keep sort of nice phasing in and out in terms of historical precedents <coughs> or antecedents to the to this big uh, uh, policy uh, debate or the issue that yields the DMCA. So, one of the earlier technological disruptions pre-internet um, was that VCR that Seth just described as as being seen to be inevitable, um, and that, of course, yielded uh, <clears throat> went to the Supreme Court in the Sony case, which was contentious enough that it had to be held over for re-argument and, you know, if Justice Marshall's papers are, are any insight, it sounds like the, somebody switched their vote and, and that case could have come out the other way. Um, what, if anything, about the advocacy and uh, sort of push and pull between technology or de device manufacturers and content owners uh, informed the policy debates in the 90s and, and from CTA's perspective, uh, was the result in the 90s satisfactory? Sure, okay, a couple of things. First of all, thank you so much for bringing us together. Like Bob, I'm kind of choked up <laughs> because the people in this room, right, and, I'm, and I'm vicariously bringing in my boss, Gary Shapiro, who's the head of CTA, who was back then the head of CEA, who was integrally involved in this whole process. But the people in this room, underfunded and facing amazing odds against the most powerful industries in DC, fought and won the most important legal and legislative battles in the history of innovation. Right, it's true. So we do a show every January in Las Vegas called CES. Right, and without the victories won by the people in this room, so many of the products on the CES floor wouldn't be there. Right, they, they simply would not exist. And so much of what we do every day on the internet, without even thinking about it, like without the people in this room, we wouldn't be able to do it. So the, the fact that this group is brought together is, is huge. And you know something? In DC, we're very good, and I know like our group, CTA, we're very good about doing things, but we're not very good about taking credit for things and reveling in our accomplishments because you're always moving on to the next thing. Right? But I would encourage this group to do this because what this group did was monumental and remains monumental years later. Uh, in terms of, of the VCR, um, Historical memory is really short, right? And you kind of forget what life was like back then, like pre-VCR. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you back to the heady days of 1984 um, in, the words of, in the words of George Atkinson. And he's describing the VCR experience. And he says, the VCR lets you choose what you want or even how you want it. You can replay it. You can say, move that back. Let's see it in slow motion. You're in total control. You tell that television what to do. Choice, time frame, what freedom, right? I mean, it's, it was revolutionary. And today, you get that same revolutionary sense from getting on Netflix or Amazon, watching your favorite movie, like download it, and, or, or getting on Spotify and, and having access, like every song ever recorded. It's, it's that same amazing sense of wonder, right? But we laid the prerequisite for that all back then. Um, so I looked back as per your question and tried to try to draw the lessons um, that we learned in the, in the VCR battles. Um, and one lesson we talked about is people want products that empower them, as the VCR did, as George Atkinson described, right? That's, that was true then, that is also true then, uh, true now with technology. 
And it's, it's that feeling of, wow, look at this amazing thing this technology allows me to do that I never thought I'd be able to do, right? And that, that remains the same. Um, the other lesson is, you don't know where it's going to go with new technologies, right? And that's, that's something that we're always talking about now when we talk to members of Congress, we're, who are concerned about you know, whatever is on the internet, right? Because with the VCR, the movie industry was very concerned about the record button, right? They didn't want people recording it. Um, but what they didn't realize was that users, consumers, were a little bit interested in the record button, but really interested in the play button. Right, and, and they wanted to go get tapes and movies and rent them. And of course, that opened up like a massive new revenue stream for the movie industry, which they did not foresee. Um, the, other, the other issue, which again is relevant today, is don't believe the hype, right? Back then in the VCR era, everybody was there. You heard, you heard about the death of television. You heard about entertainment deserts that were gonna be caused by this new machine. You heard of the MPAA. Uh, who said to Congress, we are facing a new and very troubling assault on our fiscal security, on our very economic life, and we are facing it from a thing called the video cassette recorder, and it's a necessary companion called the blank tape. And it is like a great tidal wave just offshore. The video cassette recorder and the blank tape profoundly threaten this, our life-sustaining protection. And he went on to call it, he went on to note the VCR is the American film producer and the American public as the Boston Strangler is to woman home alone. Right? And he wasn't, he wasn't exaggerating, that's what he believed, that's what he thought. That was his reality from his perspective in 1984. He was a smart guy, as we all know, and that's, that's what he believed. But of course, the industry moved in a different way. And, and you know, now the movie industry, this year, great, record revenues. Right? A lot of it from streaming and pre-recorded media that the VCR allowed. And of course, we all know about how home taping is killing music. And we also know about how online streaming is killing music. And we know that, that, uh, that, that the DVR, by allowing you to skip ads, is going to kill television, right? Fox, CBS, and NBC even sued Dish for allowing the skipping of ads. And again, they, they really thought this was it. This was the crisis. And as you know, we are now living in the golden age of television. I wasn't able to watch Game of Thrones this week, so I still have like two seasons to watch. There's like too much good TV. No, but like, think about it. It was never like this before, right? And that's what, that's what technology does. Um, and that's also true now with, with people talking about, you know, the dominance of Amazon or Google or Facebook or whatever. I mean, they may be dominant today, but you, you don't factor in the inherent dynamism of, of the tech industry. Um, I, a lot of the other, another takeaway is, like, the law says what the law says. Uh, I remember with the anti-circumvention provisions, you know, we were all assured in those negotiations that, that wait a minute, this is, this is about preventing the duplication, the illicit duplication of content, right? It, it is certainly not creating a protections for business models for garage door manufacturers or for printer <laughs> cartridge manufacturers. <laughs> Never be enforced in such a way. That's ridiculous. <laughs> right? But of course, you know, advocates take the law as far as they can, just in the same way that, that people talked about you know, the, the European Terrorism Directive, which was just enacted, that has all these, these requirements that you need to take down any terrorist-related content, whatever that means, within an hour, or face massive liabilities, right? And you know, good luck to the startup that doesn't have somebody, you know, online nights and weekends, right? But of course, we, we were assured, oh, oh, don't worry, that will, it will be enforced reasonably. We would never enforce it that way. And now a whole bunch of takedowns have been directed to the Internet Archive, addressing Grateful Dead songs and C-SPAN stuff. And I, you know, it's it's the, the law. If the law is written in an extreme way. It will, somebody will take it and enforce it in an extreme way, right? That's a lesson. Um, and then I, I, I guess the last lesson that I would take is, is that it's not over until it's over. And it's, it is absolutely not over, right? And, and Sarah was talking about this before. Right now, with the internet, we face threats uh, that, that honestly like dwarf the threats that we faced in 1984, just to the fundamental nature of free expression on the internet. Right? And, and the ability to talk, express, discuss controversial topics. Uh, you know, between threats to Section 230, between what Europe is doing with the European Copyright Directive. Um, you know, all of these rights, we, we, we've migrated to an online world, but these rights now are being threatened as never before. And we need to look backward, which is good and healthy, but also look forward because the job is, is not yet done. Well, we're, we're, we're getting short on time, but I want to give the panelists a, a 
brief chance to react to each other's comments before opening it up to questions. So I'd just like to make uh, one, not necessarily a, a negative note, but to note that, that uh, even though we've, we've been talking about the power of coalitions uh, and, and sort of uh, recognizing that we've all achieved a lot together, but I think it's also important you know, to just remember that there is uh, still always an inherent limit to the effectiveness of coalitions. And you certainly see that with Section 1201. Um, so uh, 1201 has a variety, a long list of exemptions, of, of, of permanent exceptions. And some are good, and some are less good. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the, 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 better, the, 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 the better exceptions are the exceptions that were secured by for-profit entities. The less good exceptions, and unfortunately this includes the one for, for libraries, uh, was secured by libraries. And it's not, a, a not, it's not, not nothing negative about Adam and his advocacy in particular for that exception, but it's just that at the end of the day in the legislative process, um, uh, you know, it is a, a, you know, sort of a sad fact that uh, legislators are more responsive to the interests of uh, of commercial entities, so so at the time I was representing a group of interoperable software developers, and we got a pretty good exception. Uh, and the accounting firms, uh, which actually really had no particular interest, but then I sort of sort of roped them in, and they said, "Oh yeah, yeah, we want to do this. We, we you know we're we're interested in this kind of uh, security testing." They were able, with virtually no effort on their part, which was really appalling. This when I think of all the time and you know. <laughs> effort I put in to get my exception that they just kind of waltzed in at the 11th hour. They got a pretty good exception, um, or actually maybe even a better exception than I was able to get. But then the libraries, you know, got, you know, frankly, a terrible exception. Um, and, and that is, uh, you know, and, and the coalition can, you know, really can't solve that problem. I mean, that's a, a, an unfortunate fact of the way uh, Congress works. Uh, and, and uh, you know, so... I just needed to sort of put that uh, negative note out there. Also, if I could take a snapshot of the way various versions of Section 1201 uh, read at particular points in the legislative process, I can show you a bill that's uh, a lot better than the one that ultimately came out. Uh, and lobbying these things is kind of like, you know, painting an oil painting, but every night somebody else can come in and change it. <laughs> Uh, so then, you know, you see how it comes out, and even, you know, uh, one, one last scene, uh, you know, what's now CTA, you know, re represented commercial interests. There were powerful interests on the other side, and Judiciary Committees did great in the uh, Energy and Commerce Committee, or the Commerce Committee, as it was called. John McCain in the Senate and in the House, uh, of course, uh, Circuit City was in the middle of Mr. Bliley's, uh, of Chairman Bliley's district. Great legislative history from those places and uh, from Senator Ashcroft, who was uh, who, who really got it on, on the Senate side and did wonderful work. But not everything they did, you know. It, there's the famous, you know, three element, three metrics for whether you're circumventing. And at one point, it said "and," not "or." I remember Hillary Rosen for the RAAA testified, "No, it's got to be an or, or else we're not getting anything." And that's the way it wound up. So. That's another part. Right, right. And I would just go a step further. It's, it's you know, if we just amplify that point about how the, the, the vagaries of the legislative process, you know, we, it, it could very well be that maybe we made a mistake in, in killing 1201 or what became 1201 in 1996, because arguably that, that legislation was better than what, what we ended up with in 1998, because... In the intervening period, you had uh, the the, uh, the WIPO treaty, and then more players getting involved, and and arguably the legislation actually got worse over time as opposed to better. Yeah. I would just add on uh, the WIPO treaty; um, it makes a huge difference to show up and be there in person. Uh, we basically took a plane full of telecom lobbyists who didn't know anything about copyright, and David Nimmer. And we all flew over to Geneva, and we were going up the escalator into the WIPO bunker. And 
uh, some of our friends were on the downside and they were like, holy, deleted, there they are, they're here. And you know, those people just went out, they didn't care if they didn't know, you know who these delegates were from different countries, they met them, they talked to them, they tried to explain to them how the internet worked and you know, that, that's how policy got made. Um, and, and at the time, I remember uh, maybe Bruce even told me this story that they described the WIPO meeting, it was three weeks, as took place over Hanukkah and they called it the miracle of Hanukkah because <laughs> WIPO took one day of procedure and stretched it. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and but by the way, Mr. Greenstein here blogged on the uh, Home Recording Rights Coalition website a daily blog of what was going on there. Uh, my understanding, it was read by uh, not just the the good guys, but the other guys to find out what was going on as well. Yeah, and the other anachronism, just to give you a picture of what we were dealing with, this was not only a bunker, but this was a place that hired women to go around with these little um, chimes to tell you on their arm, ding, 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 ding. <laughs> That's how you knew when to go back into the room. And they actually had elevators with the days of the week in French uh, rugs that would get switched out so you would know what day it was. <laughs> um, questions? Comments? <clears throat> Please. this so <laughs> I think that's right yeah well let me ask one question how um, how close did the DMCA come to truly dying in 1998 I mean, Jessica tells this story briefly in her book D digital copyright but she's got a lot of other business to do in that book but clearly there were you know a, as you said uh, Bob it, you seem pretty sure this wasn't this was not happening in this Congress, and then suddenly there are legs and things are on fire. Um, but things can still fall apart at the last minute. How, how cl if you look back, were, were all the pieces in place for this to have to happen, or could it have fallen apart? I, I can only say that uh, a lobbyist that we worked with uh, asked for permission to bring the whole house down. And uh, I was the one today, I, I can't. This was, you know, like in the middle of the night. I mean, I think you could, there's always the possibility of things falling apart. But, but Senator Hatch, or, who was then the, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee on the Senate <clears throat> side, I mean, he, you know, he, he, he was the one who sort of really brought together the, the, the Section 512 and Section 1201 and boat hauls. We can't forget about boat hauls. <laughs> you know, but he's the one who sort of pulled it together. Uh, sort of made this grand bargain, and uh, you know I think he was really motivated. Um, what what almost brought it down at one point was was databases because the the House passed version included a database bill and boat hulls, and then the Senate passed the Senate the Senate was sort of considering uh, you know what what to include. I mean it was definitely going to have 1201 and 512, but the question is you know what else and. 
you know, I don't know if it's true or not, but the, the you know, it's sort of like an, you know, maybe it's apocryphal, but, but um, uh, apparently uh, uh, Hatch told Howard Coble, who was the, uh, the, the chairman of the House IP subcommittee, you know, who was pushing for both boat hulls and databases, he was telling Howard, he said, Howard, you can only have one. You need to pick which one. Is it going to be, is it going to be boat hulls or is it going to be databases? And, you know, apparently, Kobel chose boat hulls. I mean, again, I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's true. Chair Chairman Kobel also got uh, on the panel before ours, uh, Johnny Cash, to testify. So, you know, where, where you know, he loved country music and Johnny Cash was a great star and a great musician and performer. So he had him on the panel. The next panel was our guys and Gary Shapiro. So it wasn't in his, one of the things I'm proudest of as somebody who writes congressional testimony is writing something into Gary's oral statement after the part about how much litigation there would be because this legislation was just too vague and important part. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in future years, we'll be referring to this legislation as a bill named Sue. <laughs> that, but it didn't mean that he helped us. All right, going once, going twice. Sold, you have a break. Thanks, <laughs> please say, thank the panel. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you for having me. I still got 50%, too, so I'm So we're going to have a 15 minute break starting at 3.45. Oh, I gotta go teach. So sad. Good luck. I'm making them debate. I don't have to do anything other than oh, that's notice easy. that they haven't been able to figure out which two they say from points. I hate this one. Which class? What's your great class? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Save the the Seminar. Their first oh, big wow. thing. Yeah. 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 Uh, Haven't we wound Johnson, down? Louisiana. Fannie Mae. I mean, like, I get it. Yeah. After the also the crisis, right? Almost immediately. I think Craig goes to Pam Samuels. Yeah. Because it was Pam. Was of course. But they did have so they paid all that back and then they have continued to pay back. Billion into the treasury, and, but they don't have any. They're, they're, they're not, private right. they're not they're originating any loans, though, right? Yes, they are. Right. Oh, they are. Oh, they are. They're totally. They're, they're, they're hard at work. They're going to work in very profitable companies. They don't really are under federal management. And what they want to do is go back to being what they were before, which is trying to. Uh, private commentaries with a stash of drawers and more. They started out as being government sponsored. Yeah. Gradually, we wish you could do what they do now. Before, I mean, I thought one of the reasons why Fannie Mae went belly up. The year is coming up soon. You know, we should do something for the housing the way price. We want to do that for them. I thought the reason why they were going to be right. But 25. I thought they were going to be because yeah. they were where you had a purchase. Oh. 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 Oh.
it's very true. Right? Like, yeah. they're, they're well, functionally well, especially in this industry, with liquidity in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. They were the, 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 the like, part, secondary when you buyer of last year's order. Really not. Definitely not. Totally could have been. Yeah. I've seen a few things. I got somebody should have solved the whole story about you getting the back end involved. Yeah. Okay. Yes. What's it for? Well, Peter and I went to the Capitol Conference. Yeah, I, I had a contact. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Y
There's no objective. It's all subjective. It's all subjective. Right, everyone has their own perception. Yeah. But it seems necessary, or or at least valuable from all these, from everything we've heard, there seems to be some real value in coalitions in which there is a lot of that there is some level of mutual respect and a lot of internal consensus building. And can you do anything anymore in the era of social media? Where, where, almost by definition, um, everything is, is being watched. It's sort of too long an anecdote to introduce with, but. I worked with a woman who worked for the uh, Change to Win, which was a coalition of unions, and she had to get everything vetted before she could say it. And so she was never allowed to say anything flexible or contemporaneous mm -hmm. at all. And weirdly, organizations can become responsible to the public in that same way of like having to be on oh, message very much so. and having to do very much so. to sort of maintain that in a way that. I don't think we could have done any of this good stuff if Rebecca had been there a lot more. Um, you will not give me a say anything bad about Rebecca, but I think that's probably true. I mean, not taking that bait, but no. No, no, I just, I mean, it's yeah. just a different uh, I'm, I'm, I, I think all of it is wonderful. I think all this transparency is great. I think it has the potential to be this empowered because, of course, it is by definition a requirement that you can impose only on yourself and your friends. Right. You can never get the, you know, the recording history to, to Right. You never get the, the, so it's a unilateral disarmament, or at least a unilateral you, choice. That's absolutely right. And yet, I'm not sure that it's a choice that we cannot. cannot. I, I don't a bell that cannot be unrung. Exactly. Exactly. All right. I'll try to do. But you think this is on the right track? I think it's very much on the right track, and I do not think it is going to a too delicate a place. Um, I just want to make sure you know. And if you don't, I told you. Yeah. I think the chance to do uh, it's been a while, yeah, the beard is all gone, I know. <laughs> I was, um, yeah, I, I changed, I know, I, I changed with the seasons. I justified them because I planned the thing. Was Ollie happy? very happy. You, they could be as well. Yeah, that's, that's, that's how I trust you. You're the one person? Yeah, that's how I trust you. I wore them. And that's why I want that to be my Sure. Well, or, oh, no, I should. They know he has got it. They didn't know I was didn't want to create any of that. That's an obligation of yours. This is some heavy hitters I wear. Yeah, that's right. I love it. 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 I love Right. 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 Right.
Like, way to go. But say it first. Yeah, you found them. I think we did. So how is this brand? Yeah. So that's a huge. And the other thing we struggled with was the sequence of those first two panels. In some sense, it would have been, it would have been, in a sort of strict chronological sense, it might have made sense to begin with the UFC, but I start with data points, because I think at the end of the day it's the biggest deal of the day. Uh, is there. So I think that that if you can mention the the it is the opposite of education. Well, I would have very much. The thing I liked about that first panel was that we didn't simply talk about the sort of organization part, but we also talked about the the sort of the. A rhetorical part, you know, how you explain it and what the examples are, and how you make it clear to people that that this very seemingly arcane and dry detail is actually important. Thank you for letting me know. I think. Obviously, any 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 version of the success you have to make. Oh God! Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Gigi to be her first intern at Bunker oh, yeah. and registered the trademark after she got the I didn't know that that's what that's the guy. There's a little history. I had history. no idea, but uh, I had to like make sure that was, I don't know if we would ever enforce that trademark. Do you remember that? Yeah, it was a wonderful discussion for the kindness that even an entity like this, um, right? It's okay. <laughs> it was. Yes, yes. Okay. I remember the person very well, and it's somebody I'm going to be with. And who's like, and who's like, who's like well, I, ta I was talking to Brewster here. Everybody here? I have our 345 panel start. Oh. That's fine. Yeah. I'm here to run the panels all the time, not make friends for you. <laughs> yeah? Okay. All right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, so I guess I was here for the uh, opening and for the first panel, and then I had to teach, and now I'm back. And what I gather is um, that there are some themes to the panels. And we don't so much have too much of a, a theme that holds us together in this panel. So we're the miscellaneous in, in some respects. And I've been asked to say that that's diversity. Um, this is the diversity panel, the diversity of approaches. So we are, um, I guess, broadening out um, some of the discussion to um, different approaches and different issues that aren't uh, hanging together so tightly. And I also gather um, that there's some uh, reference to generations um, in these panels. And we're, we're moving from the elders to youth. And we're not quite in the youth, but the good news is that we're two away from the elders. So I'm, I'm happy with that. I don't know about the rest of you. Uh, we'll take it. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely take that. <laughs> um, so anyway, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Um, this is a really lovely gathering. Um, thanks to all of you for coming. Um, my name is Christine Haight-Farley, and I'm a professor here. Um, and uh, my, my main area is trademark law. Um, and I am delighted to be joined by two of my colleagues uh, and by three guests uh, who are friends of the law school. So uh, thanks very much for being here. And um, keeping with what I heard Peter say in the first panel, we won't devote time to the um, uh, introductions and the biographies. Since you have that, you have the biographies in front of you. Um, I'll just um, go down the line. And I guess we are sitting in the order that I have. Um, and keeping with the format of the day, I will just be posing a question to each of our speakers. Um, and then um, we're just a little bit behind, but we're not so far behind. Um, I will, uh, unless somebody is going to be a, a microphone hog, uh, and that <coughs> might happen. Um, but uh, after these questions, I'm going to let... Um, the panelists respond to each other, since um, they are talking about a diverse set of issues, and then leave plenty of time for the audience um, to contribute to the conversation that we're having. So um, let me start with my colleague, um, Vicki Phillips, who is um, a professor here at the law school and directs our uh, clinic, our uh, IP clinic, which is in its 17th year. 18th. 18th year. Whoops, 18th year. Um, so, uh, Vicki, um, um, one of the things that we wanted you to talk about here is um, the lessons um, learned in the advocacy work that you've done around issues of mascotting, 
um, and Native American communities um, and um, working with both grassroots organizations and researchers um, trying to change public opinion um, and to do that maybe in conjunction with um, effort, you know, kind of litigation that was happening simultaneously and kind of um, all those moving pieces. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Um, and thank you. It's great. It's great to be here. Um, lots of pieces of my life, including the partner at my law firm that scared me the most. I'll remain nameless. Um, <laughs> but I enjoyed working with the most. Um, so, so, uh, and Prue, you know, it's wonderful to be here to celebrate you. Prue, uh, Christine mentioned that I direct the IP clinic, and Prue has probably been one of the, the most loyal friends, like many of you guys here, um, of the IP clinic, showing up at our legislative class, um, doing, uh, giving us, giving us work um, to get us going when, when Peter and I thought we would have no work, and we turned out that we <laughs> continue to have tons of work and great work, and and not the not the least of which is us, Brandon Butler, at one point. <laughs> practitioner and resident, so, so I thank you for that. Um, I guess my, my story is a, is a little different because I, I, I had to teach as well most of today, but you know, knowing the, the panels and knowing the, those of you who were on them, um, the copyright wars and, and the wonderful work that the libraries um, did over the years to forge the fair use doctrine, to fight for access to information, First Amendment rights. Um, and my, my, I have been asked to t t talk about something a, a little different um, than that. First of all, out of the copyright silo, I'm going to talk a little bit about trademark work. Um, but, but actually, I want to sort of talk about the work I've done beyond trademark. Because um, like Prue, and I, was, I'm, I learned from the work we did from the libraries that it's wonderful to do policy work when there is a library in every district, which I'm sure I've talked about today. There are stories to tell from every district anyone's author can go into. Um, we certainly have had fun teaching students to, to tell stories, and we have a conviction that lawyering is, is really storytelling, and I've been more convinced of that conviction with every, with every year and every client and every class. Um, so what I tried to do, and what a lot of my career actually has been focused on sort of the opposite. Um, trying to figure out where a, an, a line can be drawn appropriately when um, speech um, or speech slash behavior conduct hurts people and hurts the, the common good. Um, so Christine and I got involved pretty early, pretty soon after we started the IP clinic um, with Suzanne Harjo and her battle against the Washington football team's name and trademarks. Um, and as most, I'm, undoubtedly you all know, that, that battle um, fizzled out. And then Amanda Blackhorse, a younger plaintiff um, who, who did not have the latches problem that was raised as a rose, roadblock to, to, to my now very good friend and 70 plus year old son, Arjo, um, took the battle to, through the courts um, to try to get Dan Snyder to change the football team name. And um, then we had the Tam case. Simon Tam, who's great, who I adore, and who supports, supported the efforts we were making, but had his own set of facts and told a different story that the, the, the tra Washington trademark case that Amanda Blackhorse had brought um, came to an end and was, and was dismissed. The disparagement clause, the, the, the bar to registration formerly known as disparagement, um, which is now gone, and which Canyon Bar, in, in scandalous and immoral, was heard just this week in the Brunetti case. So, so interesting IP stuff <clears throat> floating around uh, in, on a daily basis, it seems. So, so, what did, so what did I do? Sort of taking Peter Yazzi and Prue's um, lessons that I learned from them in, in the copyright work we had done, um, I I sort of decided that we needed to tell more stories. We needed facts. We, I needed those libraries. I needed those, those library patrons to tell the stories of access that they needed. And unfortunately, the Native American community is a really different community than the libraries. It's not in every district. Um, it's 
basically invisible. One of my favorite quotes is from Kevin Gover, who is the head of the National Museum of American History. He has said um, that the museum, I'll, I'll, I'll find it in my report because quote, and I don't want to mangle it. He said, the Indian you most often see in Washington, D.C. is at a football game at the expense of real Indians, real history, real culture, the petty stereotype has become expected. And that's, that's where I begun my, began my story. There are people in this town, people in decision-making positions don't know Indians, don't know Indian country, have never met an Indian. They don't have one in their district for the most part. Arjo pointed it out best to me when she said, Vicki, look, look at the Department of Interior org chart. Fish, wildlife, Indians. Look at who are mascots. Fish, wildlife, <laughs> And a little thing like that, it became so clear to me. That's just wrong. So, I, so what I set out to do, and, and to answer your question, now I will start to answer your question. Um, I worked with, I got together, the trademark case had fizzled out. And I thought, how can we move this battle forward with, with the litigation front looks like it's not going to be successful? How can we bring forward stories of young Native Americans and frankly, all our children, um, how this is harming, how these racialized mascots are harming um, Native and Native American Indian kids and, and all our kids, because that's their perception of them, mummified. Here's the Illinois, um, Chief Illinois, the Illinois mascot made the, the cover of our report. So I worked with a native staffer at the Center for American Progress to develop a report where we interviewed native youth about, about the effect of this. Um, and, and, you know, we all knew the research that, that, um, that the, the, the uh, American Counseling Association, the American Psychological Association, over the years, all of these <clears throat> groups had called on schools and colleges, and not just universities. These mascots are obviously in, in high schools throughout the country as well. And the NCAA, all of these groups had, re had called in the early um, turn of this millennium, had called for the, the retirement of these mascots. Um, as, as these negative stereotypes were harming, were harming kids. Um, the psychological research had really shown and, and, and dug into it that, and Christine and I both dug into it for, the, for our brief, that, that the lower self-esteem of, of this youth and the mental health, health for them um, can, be, can be created by these unwelcome and hostile learning environments of these mascots being at the, the school events. Um, so, so even though call, people had called for this for years, and I, and I think what's really, what, what really astounded me is that this battle to um, get rid of the Washington football mascot had started in the 70s. We all sort of became aware of it when, when the, the, the action was filed, but this is actually something that Suzanne Harjo had been, had been writing Edward Bennett Williams about for years and meeting with him trying to get this name changed. So the, the, the problem with this as a campaign is that it sort of goes and ebbs and flows when football season starts, and then people sort of forget about it. And then there are a couple protests. So, so the, the, the challenge was how to sort of create a systematic campaign. Um, so we created this report, and this report came out in July of 2014, and it really shared some of the stories of the, of the Native students, in their own words, what they experienced. Um, you know, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just read one um, that Dakota Kicking Bear Brown, um, who's a, 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 a Miwok student and football player, he describes the environment of his California high school. Our cheerleaders dressed up one of our own students, a Native student, in a Halloween Pocahontas costume. Whenever I say Pocahontas right now, I, I'm reminded of this is happening sort of outside of stadiums and high school football fields, too. It's, it's happening in, in, in the White House, which is crazy. Um, but they dressed her up in a Pocahontas costume and tied her to a stake after dragging her out on the field in shackles against her will. 
They proceeded to dance around her, acting as if they were beating her and treating her like a slave. This is the most sickening halftime show I've ever witnessed. So their native youth are telling this story about how, how it made them feel, but all of our kids at these schools are being exposed to this. And what the report tried to do, and what we tried to do is piece together um, stories for a community that is very disparate and a very difficult community um, to get their voice out there um, and try to bring civil rights groups, um, leadership conference and civil rights and other groups to this cause. But, but it's, it's a difficult coalition. And, and we all know about co coalitions. And this has been a difficult coalition to make the native voice sing through in these, um, in these groups because every, every one of these groups has, has their priorities. And, and this is not seen since it's a, since it's a, a trademark issue or a a speech issue, it's not seen as, as, a, as a harm. It's seen as, um, you know, it comes out of Dan Snyder's mouth. They've got bigger problems than my trademark. They've got poverty. They've got health issues. They've got education issues. They've got suicide issues. That's all true. This, this community is really challenged and has a lot of, a lot of um, huge, huge obstacles. But some of the, the, the leaders that I've talked to and the, and the kids we talk to the way they are perceived in society as leading to other problems until people see them as real people, not dehumanized like fish and wildlife and, and the mascots that they are. They're not going to be able to overcome, and their kids aren't going to be able to overcome. So, so the report was, was released, and we had some recommendations in it. And you know, like everyone in this room knows, it's always a long battle, and it's a continuing battle. Um, under the former administration, we had the Department of Education um, Office of Civil Rights Coalition um, uh, on, and we met with them, and they 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 held field hearings on this issue. And there have been there has been modest change. The, the Cleveland Indians, uh, their chief Wahoo. But it's a, it's a continuing battle, and I'm hoping, if I can get my act together, to continue this, having worked on another project for a couple of years, to release um, an update to this report um, in, in, in time for Native American um, Recognition Month in fall. So hopefully I'll have more. Thank you. OK, next, um, we have Ryan Clough, who's the General Counsel for Public Knowledge. And Ryan, the question for you is, what lessons did IP advocates learn from SOPA PIPA, and are they useful going forward? Sure. Uh, well, it's an honor to be here. And it's really interesting to hear Victoria talk about stories. And I, I really do agree that at all levels of policy making and policy advocacy, lobbying, both in terms of narratives in the public, you know, broad public sphere as well as what's happening in the halls of Congress, like the narrative really is critical, the dominant conventional narrative. Um, and, and I think, you know, you can sort of ask some questions and think about what narratives played out in Sova Pippa. You know, to me, the obvious narrative, I think a lot of people in the room, news to a lot of people, is that the obvious sort of lesson from Sova was that an, an overwhelming public outcry against legislation can, over, can Beat even the most seemingly dominant inside DC game. And so I was in the house, I worked for uh, Zoe Lofgren from California, oftentimes lonely voice on copyright issues uh, <laughs> um, on balance. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I will say, like, no one, including us, certainly in the house, expected SOPA and PIPA to happen as they did. I think almost everyone, if, if you can prove that you predicted the outcome of SOPA and PIPA before the fact, you should. Uh, at least publicize that and take some credit because I don't know anybody who really could have predicted what happened. And the key thing was the public outcry above all else. And um, I think the, you can connect that public outcry to a couple of different narratives that really got a level of moral outrage about the bill and just general disgust that really powered such the backlash to the point that, you know, 
People like Marsha Blackburn, who was one of the staunchest advocates for SOPA, had to disavow it. I mean, that, there, there were moments, there were truly surreal moments in SOPA where you had Marsha Blackburn saying, this, this bill goes too far on copyright. It's like, okay, something is, is wrong here. Something has changed. Um, or actually, something is right here. But anyway, um, the narratives that, that, I, that I can think about that really were key in, in, the, in the protest against SOPA, I, I would identify three. One was just um, insider versus outsider backlash against special interests, the perception that Congress was favoring a very narrow industry with lobbyists against the general public. That was a successful thing that really turned a lot of people outside D.C. off against SOPA and got them inspired. Um, the second was sort of the geek, non-geek, or techie versus dinosaur narrative or dichotomy where um, members of Congress still today, occasionally, I, I think it's actually a little unfair and a little exaggerated, but oftentimes they have a habit for saying very ignorant things about technology or uh, individuals really not knowing what they're talking about, and and it's a very easy narrative to catch on. Of like members of Congress, there they go again, screwing up the um, That was another key thing, and I think the third one, and this is especially where you know crew and libraries, um, among a lot of other folks, have been critical in, in this narrative, is is really the dichotomy between censorship and control of information versus free expression and, and openness on the internet, and. You know, those three narratives combined really took hold, I think, both eventually in D.C., but more importantly in the public's mind. And there was a ton of amazing work that was done by a lot of folks to really organize and mobilize people in protest. Um, and the key thing was those narratives really, like, then were able to overpower what the dominant narrative typically is in D.C. on IP, which is, like, things are being stolen, everyone else is being irresponsible, and artists have to be protected, which, even if that's true at times, it's, like, usually and it obviously doesn't get to all the questions about balance and the necessary trade-offs in copyright policy and ex externalizing enforcement costs um, on other people. So um, I think that's the key lesson from SOPA, which, is, again, it's pretty obvious. It's like public outcry, if you can get it going, really does trump cynical inside DC politics. The question is, it's, it's obviously not easy to create, recreate that. And I think there's a real question about whether or not you could have that happen again today. For a couple of different reasons, I think that um, I do wonder a lot, and I, I don't know the answer to this question, but I wonder a lot whether or not if SOPA had come up in today's environment with the amount of now skepticism and sort of fear of the internet and sort of understandable in some ways justified like doubts that we're all having about the impact of, of technology in our society, if there still would have been protests, but would they have grown in the same way? Would they have sparked off in the same way? I'm not sure that they would have, or at least I think it potentially would have been looked different um, than it did in 2011, 2012, when I think we were still in a bit of a more, um, say, naive, some would say, just more innocent, yeah, innocent view of the internet and technology, um, certainly well before the 2016 elections, among many other things. The other thing, and I'll just close with this, is, uh, you know, obviously we've lived in a partisan political environment for a long time. Uh, one question, though, is I think it's even getting worse and worse in that I think the public increasingly has trouble even understanding policy issues that aren't in a partisan frame these days. And, and copyright is actually one of those that historically hasn't been that partisan. It's actually one of the cool things about it. Is on SOPA, I got to work with all kinds of Republican offices, um, which you don't get to do as a House Democratic staffer very often, um, even in 2011. And But today, it seems like in terms of how the public thinks about politics, I just I wonder how much everything has to be filtered through this party is for it, this party is against it, or else people just don't understand it or have a natural sort of like emotional connection to it in the same way. And so that's a question because there's upsides and downsides. Like if you look at net neutrality, it's become a very partisan issue. That is upsides in that you've convinced the Democratic Party to basically champion it institutionally in DC. The flip side is the partisanship is the reason why net neutrality regulations have not been restored, even despite overwhelming public support in the public on both sides of people on both sides. So there's there's upsides and downsides, but I do think that's another question. How in, in future battles, and they're coming <laughs> on copyright and related issues, um, how do they play out in terms of getting filtered through partisan? Very interesting. Thank you. Um, so next, I turn to my colleague, Hilary Brill, who is a professor here and teaches with Vicki in the IP clinic. And uh, Ryan has made a nice segue to the question I'm going to ask you, um, which is, 
Um, can you do a compare and contrast, maybe, of IP the IP policy environment in the late 90s um, and since then? Thank you. I want to echo uh, what I've also said here that it is really a privilege to get to honor you, crew, and uh, to have this opportunity to be with so many distinguished attendees that are all highlighting the impact that you have had on not just um, copyright policy and IP policy, but so many people here today. I uh, am enjoying, like so many other people here, the fact that you have brought us all together to relive so many great stories, including some of the policy that, um, and policy changes that, we, that, that I'm going to discuss, but I want to thank you for that. I had the honor of meeting Prue when I was a legislative counsel for Rick Boucher. Um, it wasn't the late 90s, but I have been working on policy since the late 90s. It was the early aughts, the 2000s. And I actually have met many of the people that you guys are here today um, through that office. And I remember when Prue came in and Miriam, or Miriam too, and uh, you, you truly embodied what I had in my mind of a, 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 a librarian and how they would present themselves. Um, and to two members of Congress and how they would present themselves positively on policy. You were humble. You were kind, you were sharp as a whip. I mean, unbelievably smart, intellectual, and if either one of you told me to be quiet, I would immediately, <laughs> I would just listen to what you have to say and start reading a book. The respect that um, the member of Congress I worked for, who, as many of you in this room know, did not suffer fools. He respected you tremendously. If there was an issue on our copyright policy, talk to, talk to, the, these wonderful um, women that work for the library. So I, I, I really do feel like things have come full circle, and thank you so much for having me here. I wanted to talk about those experiences because when I was um, working on my first legislative issue, and you guys talked about it, database. I actually worked on the database, and I appreciate the comment that someone said, <clears throat> you, were, you were around it? I said, yes, that was my first legislative amendment that I had to introduce as a young person. My, my, my first job on the Hill, wasn't quite sure what I was doing. Mark Emerickson, who you saw, he was here. Um, he was there. I was working with, I think, Yahoo and AOL and many of the folks that were here as well. And I remember that that was a win. That amendment was a win. Um, and that it was quite noticeable that there was a small win in this world that we were in. And that really was a constant that I saw, just as sort of a new person coming in. You guys had already been doing this. This is really what happened in these hearings. I'd like to know from Ryan. We could have a coffee here, being with Lofgren. This is how it would go down when I was in a hearing. We'd have a copyright issue. It would be introduced. You'd have a bill introduced. And the issues then were camcorders. You guys remember that in movie theaters? You're like, oh, you have a camcorder issue. Database. Um, DMCA 1201, right? A lot of you guys with the, um, that issue. In fact, I'm still called 1201. Richard Bates from Disney does not know my real name. He calls me 1201 wherever we go. Um, so we would talk about issues. Congressman Boucher would say his piece on behalf of the Fair Use community, and at that time, now aligning with a new nascent internet company, right? That was a new kind of industry aligning with you guys. That was the beginning of a change in the law. And then Congressman Lofkin would say, Something that was usually on par with what he had to say. Also brilliant. And then you had Canon back in the day. And you just didn't know what Canon was going to say. And I don't know if this is Chad Mass Rule. Um, he's not there anymore. Sometimes we call him loose Canon. We just didn't know what was going to come out. Was it going to be on our side? Was it not? But sometimes Canon. And interestingly enough, that was bipartisan. It was usually a not, it wasn't really a partisan issue. Fair use. Just wasn't at that time. It truly came down to what I saw immediately. And not knowing this whole issue, it was between legacy content owners and their community and everybody else, which at the time happened to be fair use community, educators, libraries, and this nation. And it was frustrating. It was very frustrating to see that happen. So as all of these issues continued and moved forward, it was no surprise to me. It was always, the at the time, the chairman was Sunny Brenner, um, and I think Smith at the time, they would come up with every single year and every single Congress a new 
type of legislation that would promote something that would be more IP enforcement. They would work with DOJ, work with content owners, and then you'd have Lofgren say something. And else, and, and that was that. Um, I left, I went to work for the internet industry. I continued to work on these issues, but a little bit different. But it was the same thing. Every time I went, I saw it. So when SOPA came around, so I get the he said, she said side. He was working for Lofgren, I was working for Indicator. So when SOPA came around, I felt it was the same merry-go-round. We're just going to go to this dog and pony show. Smith is going to introduce this bill. And then we're going to have Lofgren say something, Bowser say something. I don't know who else was, maybe said something. You might remember. Eventually, it, it was Issa and yeah, yeah, but not that time. Not at all that yet. Maybe so maybe Bachelor Lofgren would be like, this isn't a good idea. So that was the plan. And truly, when you said, would anyone have predicted it? No one. The success that we were going to bring home, the success to say, we delayed the hearing, that was going to be a success. Um, we introduced 50 amendments, which did happen. We introduced 50 amendments, right? That's why I was looking at right? like this happened. And we got one pass. Like, these were going to be the successes that we had to explain to people back home because they don't know how Congress works and having a delayed hearing is out. <laughs> so that was going to be it. And it was the same exact thing until January 18th. Anyone remember? The blackout. Right? 18th? 18th? The blackout. And you were on the Hill, so your experience would be different. But my experience was I was walking on the Hill going to offices. And it was completely different that day than it was the day before. And that day, people would come and say, stop. The phones broke down. The servers broke down. Um, it clearly was a change in policy, right? It was a change in, it was a marker, at least. I would say it was a marker and a change of policy. And I don't think this is unprecedented, but I don't know when it's ever happened. Other folks in this room might know. People were dropping off that building. <coughs> So this was done me pass that afternoon, like it was going to be the day to get me off of this. I want nothing to do with this. Mm -hmm. That hearing never, never finished. I mean, that markup never finished. It's still like halfway done. <laughs> the markup's still there, halfway done. And it truly changed the conversation. I can't say it truly changed policy. When you say it, have some, so some things have remained, some things have changed. There is now potentially a voice that's being heard more. There are baby steps that we're moving forward, um, even now with trade, for example, with the Mexico-US relations. Some of you may be working on that with the digital trade discussions. There's actual discussions to maybe protect the internet, for example. Or there's discussions, which isn't quite fair use, but there are discussions that are a little bit moving forward. But things haven't truly, truly changed in the dynamic where the content legacy on, um, uh, its owners still truly do have a stronghold. It isn't the Jack Valenti days. Did his name come up already? Right? Many times, right? I figured it did. Um, it's a little bit different, but some things do also remain constant. I mean, you guys are the same people who have been fighting this fight for a long time, right? Like, we, we, we still are fighting this fight. Um, but what I think happened after that day with SOPA, when people were dropping off like flies, and the voice was finally being heard, there was this fear to touch anything. And there were phone calls that I received from NBC Universal, and I received it from the MPAA, people saying, what the hell just happened? What do we do now? And I was like, I'm just enjoying this lunch. David Green, I'm looking at Professor Yazi over there. I'm like, remember him? I would have this lunch, and we would have this conversation. And my view of it then, and I love your view at some point, but my view of it still remains the same. It was a Frankenstein. It was definitely a monster. But you don't know what Frankenstein's going to do. You don't know when it's going to turn. So I do think it's still there. I don't think it would necessarily be the same effect. But if you shut down Instagram, if you don't think millennials would come crashing into Congress, there are powerful tools that can be used. Would people use it? Would they be motivated to use it? What would make it the meaning to be you know, used? But there is a user community. So how we make policy is totally different. It is internet user-based. And moving forward with policymaking, you have to consider that and what you do. So I think it's, it's, it's definitely a testament to a lot of the people here that some things have remained constant. Mm. We still fight the fight. And we do recognize that some tools have changed. But you still need sharp, humble, kind, great people like you, Prue, 
and um, other people in this room to continue to push all the issues that you have. Delay in a university to get to do the things that we're doing. Thank you. Okay, so next we'll hear from Nancy Weiss. Nancy Weiss is the general counsel for the U.S. Institute of Museum and Library Services. <clears throat> and we're going to make a radical shift here um, to the Marrakesh Treaty um, for the Visually Impaired, um, <coughs> which um, was a multi-year campaign um, that you followed both um, as a member of the delegation and then from the White House. And the question we'd like you to address is, um, what do you think are the characteristics of that effort that enabled its success? Um, I'm really happy to be here. I'm going to actually give my sort of themes that I'll talk about, and then I want to talk just for a minute about Prue and of course. Uh, the role in relationships. So um, for that one, just stay tuned. You need a good issue. <laughs> you need a good team. And everybody in this room, at some level, has been part of that. Um, you need good process. You need good le legislation, domestic legislation. I think that's a theme I heard a little bit um, in here. And you also need a lot of resilience. Um, hmm. But I, I've been thinking, as I've been sitting here, a lot about venue. And mm -hmm. um, you know we're in this beautiful room. And I'm thinking a little bit about Notre Dame and the fire there and the impact that it's had on people, both uh, in France, but really around the world. And I just finished reading a book, um, the Susan Orleans book. I finally got around to reading the library, um, which is about a fire in um, the LA uh, Public Library. And, um, and sort of thinking about what these institutions mean to us and the role they play in our communities um, is, is really so important and what we put towards them. And I was introduced to the library community pretty early on by Prue, who, um, as you were saying, um, has always been a very trusted voice uh, for me. But also, as I was in meetings with my sister agencies, and I will just say, of course, these are my own perspectives. <laughs> they don't necessarily represent um, either the Institute of Museum and Library Services or uh, the US government. But people, I started seeing how people would listen to the perspective of what she put forward. And, and even as I'll talk about through um, the Marrakesh uh, negotiation process, the key word was, what does Prue think about this? So it really <laughs> was, made a very big difference. Um, but I've also been thinking, kind of picking up on you, Vicki, about uh, football stadiums and the message from the University of Michigan football stadium that says, those who stay will be champions. <laughs> and really, what we've been talking about all day is that long-term effort and role and what it takes to um, really be there and how we help um, one another continue to carry batons. Even when it's, um, it's really lovely, and I'm honored to be here. So I get to talk a little bit about a good news story, a good story in this. Um, the Marrakesh Treaty is, a, um, uh, simply put, is a, is a World Intellectual Property Organization copyright treaty. And it both requires uh, countries or member states to have copyright um, limitations and exceptions um, that enable uh, accessible access to public works, and then also it um, creates a mechanism to uh, share these accessible format materials throughout the world, both to mm -hmm. individuals and author also through uh, authorized entities, including libraries. And um, so sort of you need a good story. Um, so on a personal level, I, I worked in libraries when, uh, since junior high school mm -hmm. and was um, <clears throat> the Kurzweil machine, which reads handwriting um, aloud to people who are blind, thus enabling them to have direct communications with whoever is writing to them and not have other, um, uh, other people you know, reading the personal letters or getting engaged, and really thought a lot about you know, what that means. Um, years, years go by, 
And, um, and the Institute of Museum and Library Services is the federal agency that supports museum library information services to meet the needs of the American public. One thing that the agency does is support the libraries for the blind. So those libraries get accessible format materials from the National Library Service at the Library of Congress. So those are materials that the, the National Library Service makes accessible. But also, each of those, um, the libraries for the blind, um, uses our domestic copyright exception, the Chafee Amendment, that enables them to make special format materials for their patrons. So there are some state library uh, administrative agencies that are the libraries for the blind, for example, in California, that makes local content available and also delivers the materials from the National Library Service. There are some other, New York Public Library is the library for the blind in New York State. So it's really important. So we started getting, um, hearing that there were some real challenges in that um, uh, these libraries were not able to share materials outside of the country. Um, and you know, what, what were different things that we could do? Um, as that was going on, uh, there was also a discussion, and this is kind of a, I'm summarizing a, almost a two-year process here, but there were discussions going on at the World Intellectual Property Organization looking at um, what are the necessary limitations and exceptions needed within the copyright community. Others have talked about sort of the history of that and how that was placed on the agenda. But there were some discussions about what limitations and exceptions are needed for individuals who are blind or print disabilities. So um, in those discussions, there was um, uh, the usual that goes on in these international meetings, well, you know, this is how it works, we can't do anything, etc. Um, and, and the U.S. was having kind of an interesting moment there because, you know, we do something domestically. We're hearing that there's a problem, and why can't we look at this and talk about it? And so um, the White House actually reached out, and through the Domestic Policy Council, and, and, and asked um, IMLS, a couple of agencies, what do you think about this? And you know, simultaneously, there were efforts going on, um, both with stakeholders you know, who are here, um, as also, also some countries, of, of trying to look at this. But we were, we were like, yeah, this is a problem. We do think we should be able to do it. And so we actually got some direction from the Domestic Policy Council as well as the special assistant to the president or assistant to the president um, for disability rights. And you know, we were told, look at this issue. So we went to the Patent and Trademark Office. They appointed um, Justin Hughes, a person there. And we brought together the Copyright Office, the Patent and Trademark Office, IMLS were actually the beginning ones. But we brought in, um, as we looked at the issue, and really decided, let's study it. So we had case law. We had all sorts of things. But we realized we wanted to make sure that we were coordinating with other, other agencies and organizations. So for example, um, in the government, we have a trade policy process, international <laughs> trade policy negotiation process. We also have an intellectual property enforcement process. So those are two statutory processes set up with very certain agencies. Um, uh, and um, you know, we wanted to make sure that we coordinated, um, understood what the sensitivities were, um, but also made sure that we looked through this particular issue, thinking about how to handle this issue. And that plays out there. So ultimately, we had a, a good team with people from the Department of Justice Civil Rights Office, US Trade Representative, State Department, IMLS, Department of Education, Copyright Office, um, and US Patent and Trademark Office. And we dug in. We, we also thought this was a good opportunity to say, we believe in intellectual property rights and, and enforcement. Um, at the same time, we also believe in the role of limitations and exceptions for, um, for an effective and robust copyright system. 
Um, so again, we were able to have that enforcement one, and we also incorporated US trade representatives, sort of making sure we identified the issues with trade. Um, but then the team not only studied itself, but throughout the process met together as a team with the stakeholders that we could identify. So often there's sort of one-off meetings. You know, people work closely with particular stakeholders. And we very intentionally all met with uh, associations and individuals who are blind. Um, we all met with the content owner, uh, individuals. <laughs> To, and associations. We all met with the library community. And we're able to hear the questions others were asking, develop that kind of trust together as a team, and, uh, and ended up um, drafting an approach internationally, which we presented at the World Intellectual Property Organization. And the EU said that they would join in if we also gave model domestic exceptions. So um, again, good team, and on that, that's where, what does Prue think? What does Alan think? You know, it was everybody, you know, let's check in. Where are we going with this? And that, that actually worked quite, a, quite well, and the more that people looked at this issue, the more people came together. So I will tell you that the Marrakesh Treaty will ultimately take effect in the United States um, on May 8th. And I already have the entire interagency team, people I haven't heard from for months saying, when are we going to celebrate? But um, <laughs> so this actually, you know, the US took a position there, um, uh, negotiated it, and <clears throat> in the miracle of um, in Marrakesh, the miracle of Marrakesh was that we were able to negotiate a treaty. And as I said, many of us, Jonathan, they were, were there. So um, I, I kind of, um, it will always be memorable to me because, um, among other things, Stevie Wonder gave us a private concert. He said, if you can negotiate this treaty and get it signed, sealed, delivered, I will come and play for you. And he did. And there were about 100 of us left at the time, and it was just momentous. But it was also really, you know, I didn't understand his role in the Kurzweil machine. He actually was the person who was like, hey, can we use this technology to make sure that we have, you know, have some access to accessible materials. So, um, you know, having having a good um, having good leaders like that is really important. Um, and as I said, one thing that was helpful was also having good domestic legislation. So we have the Chafee Amendment. We have experiences with that. And the United States always likes to say we negotiate from the position of you know um, is this. Uh, lawful under US law, and we'll take it from there. And so we really worked very hard in the Marrakesh Treaty to try to make sure that it did, um, it did track with US law. Now, it was really helpful at the beginning to have that um, White House leadership you know, outside um, and to be able to also have that strong voice um, with the interagency process with the imprimatur of the Domestic Policy Council of saying, this is something really important. Figure out how to get it, and what to do. And at the beginning, we actually didn't even have a We were like, let's look at the issue, and let's see where there, you know, whether there's a problem here, and if so, what are ways that we could possibly address it? Um, so I think it was helpful to have that kind of an open mind. and people who are willing to go forward. In terms of um, continuing it, you do need somebody uh, who is going to make sure that the process moves forward. So having the, the people who are there and staying and watching and monitoring and bringing to people together is really important. I think it also is important that having the group, which was pretty much the same, really meet with everybody and understand the, the issues made it possible for us to try to um, negotiate or address each other's challenges. So I think that's really important. And I, I would just say that, you know, you really do need these champions. You need sort of, uh, you know, in talking here today, I think there's the role of the executive branch, then there's the relationships um, with Congress that everybody has in, in different ways, and keeping those moving forward is essential. 
And, but I do think that um, it is important for people to engage with the governmental processes available. And I think from Marrakesh, it really is helpful to be focused on the mission. Like, you know, what are we trying to accomplish? How do we make sure that, um, you know, as we're talking through all these technicalities here, we're really navigating and addressing an issue that has been presented. I always say the Jimmy Stewart story. What is it that is, you know, uh, that really you go to people and say, how could anyone not want to address this? How could we not do something? So thank you for all of your leadership. And, uh, as I said, the treaty has gone into effect. I think 84 countries are now part of it, and it will come into effect. Uh, in the United States on May 8th, and we're really working with WIPO to make sure that um, we can deliver on our promise and actually have accessible format materials to share with other people. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so our last speaker is going to bring it all home and bring it all together for us. Uh, <laughs> no pressure. Carrie Russell is the Director of Public Advocacy for the American Library Association. <laughs> And um, as everybody uh, uh, who is not a student here knows, but I think what has been uh, really nice for the students who have wandered in and out of the room um, over the course of the day, um, libraries have played a crucial role in um, many of the issues that we've talked about today, um, especially database, um, the database struggle and the copyright <coughs> wars. And so the question for you is, how has their advocacy function changed, and where do you see it going in the future? Well, I want to thank thanks for being invited. And this is a great honor for me, because I've probably worked with Prue um, more, the most closely, um, uh, except for a couple other people here, over the last 20 years. And it's going to be a big change when she leaves. Um, <clears throat> Sorry. Um, I, you know, I, when I looked at the question that was sent ahead of time, I was like, what are they talking about? Are they talking about LCA, like our coalition? Or are they talking about the advocacy of our members? Or, you know, I just was like, I'll wait until I get there and then figure out what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> so I decided I would talk about our coalition, the Library Copyright Alliance. And I would say that we are, I feel like we are really strong. I think we can make things happen. And the coalition is great because we only meet when we have to and we get our work done and then we go and do it. It's like the most efficient group, even though you're dealing with these really complex um, issues. Um, and we, we both work, um, most of us, in a membership organization. I work for ALA. So I've got 54,000 members. Crew works for ARL. She's got 123, 24 research libraries. And so those are the people that pay our salary. Um, and some of them are persnickety. Some of them are, you know. So it's also, it's like you're doing like the inside the beltway thing. But then you're also doing like, OK, what about the members? And it's you know two different strategies. And I think we do really, really well. When I first came, I was working at the University of Arizona, so I knew Prue before um, I worked for ALA because I was working at an, a research institution. And um, when I came, you know, I didn't really know anything about inside the Beltway. And in fact, my job was totally just copyright education to members. So, you know, I think Prue, like, really kind of it is, was the example of this is what it is inside the Beltway. So I would, just, you know, whatever she said, I would be like, yeah, OK. She, she knows what she's talking about. Um, and um, she was really like the center of our coalition, I would say. Um, I also, when I first started, I had this kind of fascination with Jack Valenti. Um, I would go to hearings, you know, copyright hearings, even though I didn't have to because I wasn't a lobbyist then. I just want to. You know, Jack Lenny's going to be there. And I was always amazed that he would come where the Congress people came out, the door where the Congress people came out, Jack Lenny would come out that door and, and go to take a seat. He never walked in the front door. He'd, he'd always be like, here he comes, blah, blah, blah. 
Um, so, you know, that was kind of interesting, and I, I'll never forget it. And I remember, because no one knew who I was, I stood by Jack Valenny kind of eavesdropping, and I can't remember what the issue was, but he said, where are the libraries on this? It was to his Galapius. Where are the libraries? And I thought, you're afraid of the libraries. Yes. Libraries <laughs> <laughs> are really, really strong. Um, I think um, we are almost, I would say we're also, we're almost like impressive. I really want to say that. Libraries, library associations, we're really, we're like impressive. And some issues that our members Nobody's really. Nobody's disagreeing with you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, you know, when you look back and you look at the history of the copyright law, and, you know, we were there at the 76 Act, you know, and that took forever. I mean, we, we started out really being like very um, um, interested in authors' rights, the associations, but, you know, then we moved into other stuff as well. Um, but we were really strong, and um, when people, somebody like the motion picture industry says, you know, where are the libraries, then you know you're pretty good. Um, I wanted to mention also that our coalition, I think, you know, we had more members at one time, and now we have less members than we had before. We have an excellent legislative council with Jonathan Band. We're very, very fortunate that we all get along. We almost always agree, and when we walk out of the room, we know that we're right. We know that what we decided was right, because we're right. Um, and, and that's a lot of fun. It's like the, most, the best part of my job, really definitely, is working in LCA. Um, I think now that we have younger members coming into the profession, I think we're going to see more, well, we already have seen more librarians engage in advocacy. Um, the digital environment has really been the key to that, and librarians are interested in, in copyright now, copyright now more than they were before. And we have now more tools to use, advocacy tools and software that allow us to send out messages to everybody that's a friend of a library, and then all of a sudden we get 17,000 responses. When somebody says they're going to do something to Carla Stoffel, who's our librarian, we're, you know, our members are going to be upset. And they were. And I think it's, it just shows, again, how we're strong. Um, when, I was, when I was at the Arizona, I came back after being at ARL, and somebody said, well, what is that Prue Adler really like? You know, I see her, but how, what is she like? I said, she's impressive. <laughs> That's what I remember. I said, she's impressive. <laughs> and then one time, we were coming back from a retreat. <clears throat> I was already working for ALA. We were in a car. We are driving back to, to D.C. We had been at, like, I don't know where, somewhere else, um, nearby, West Virginia or something. And Prue got a phone call on her cell phone. I think it was about government documents, and it was something bad. And we were all talking and visiting. Then she got the call. And then she started to call, like, five people in a row. Boom, boom. You do this. Don't you know about that? This just happened. We have to do this, blah, blah, blah. Just like got everybody all in order. And this is like a lot of people beyond just us, but other people in the government information world. And I just looked at her and I said, <laughs> <laughs> So I think um, our, our coalition um, is probably the best coalition that really represents the public. Because as you said, we have a library in every congressional district, and we really use that to our advantage when, when funding opportunities arise. Um, and I think that we're going to be stronger because our members are a little more aware. And I think that we're going to go through kind of a slow time now. We can sit back, rest, rest <laughs> on our laurels, and just, you know, feel good about what we did because we really have made a difference. Thank you. Uh, so anyone on the panel want to respond to anything that another panelist has said before we go to the audience? I've been thinking a lot about the story, storytelling and mm -hmm. what stories get told <clears throat> in different places. And I think, you know, um, uh, even 
in the in the Marrakesh Treaty, there were a lot of interesting stories um, that played out on the negotiating floor at, at WIPO. Um, one was interesting to me because it was always um, the treaty is about publishers and individuals who are blind, and um, and that was it. And it was what I found fascinating. And again, consider the source a little bit. Represent the United States government in this, not individuals, um, agencies. But was I always thought of providing access as a three-legged stool, right? You've got the publishers, um, the individuals who are blind, but we also have a law that very much depended on um, the, the authorized entities, the libraries for the blind and stuff. And so anyway, I just kind of watched that play out a little bit and, um, and how that got reinforced and how that, that was a little bit, I think, a problem in the negotiation. And, um, and so I think, you know, one question I think a lot about is how do you kind of, um, recognize a story, change a story? Because I think that was really important, especially for a treaty that relies on authorized <laughs> entities to carry out its basic provisions. Right. Audience, what, what reactions, comments, questions do you have for this panel? have a response to that um, just because it gives me a chance to talk about libraries um, we do there are many stories of libraries in, all over the country where homeless people come to the library they don't have any other place to go um, and they often start to be you know using the computers and start to build their resumes we offer all kinds of pro programs on how to do your resume and we offer like interview skills training. And we, you know, learning English, all kinds of things that we really do actually help people advance out of homelessness and, and into society. Um, in fact, there's a library in Denver, public library, that has a little, um, like, I guess like a, uh, what do you call that? It's like a big van kind of outside of the library. 
and it's got washing machines and dryers in it. So, I mean, we do touch people in all those different kinds of ways. So it's, you know, I appreciate that you realize that. And I think stories of libraries. Those of us who have been fighting with establishing <coughs> for a long time, larger question around like, what is the information that we're always good at access to? <coughs> Decades, and I think that's that's really the, the questions that I think we need to answer. Not just what is the next carry bill from an entertainment model, though that is awesome. Yeah, awesome. But what are the like what are the things that the public have today that they really should, or that not enough of the public has? And that does get beyond copyright. But it, I would say also, it's sort of first of all, we know that. I think the number is something like 72% of libraries are the only source of free internet access in 72% of communities. And, um, and I think you know, we obviously have a long um, national priority of making sure that, that everybody has access to library services, whether it's the Library of Congress or there's a library in the White House or um, you know, library services in every community. And I, and I think that is the, the sort of mission question, you know, which is what do we think is appropriate and how do we address it? Anyone else or shall we go to a break and have a casual conversation? Okay, join me in thanking this wonderful panel. as soon as they get a chance. We'll actually have a very short break here, just for a moment for coffee or bathroom, and then we'll get started hopefully in about five minutes so we can have plenty of time for the celebration after. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Have fun. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. She's enjoying it. She's working for some time. Oh, beautiful. I remember. She's a member of the studio gallery. So she's got a show coming up. Do you have any pictures of her? Or like, uh, let's ride this way. If, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I can't believe it. I'll clean this up and I can you know that can all stay for the next one. For example, I, I don't have to be still the to be the like the 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 so, you know, the lessons you draw. Peter, sadly, I cannot stay. Hopefully, there'll be other occasions. There are some of the other stories, you know, that some of them might just. Some of them just forgot about. You know, and they get stimulated. <laughs> <laughs> she made What's the name of this? Oh. It was it was based on a photo. Well, hopefully, she I think she's in the theme for her next show in New York. So that was a relatively small version of it, like this big. I think she's going to do a big one. It reminds me of the Red Cross. They were only very
Hi, Peter. Take care. <laughs> oh, well, how are you? Well, I mean, you know, I, as I said to Carrie, it's, it's not often you get to go to your wife's wake. Right? Well, <laughs> well I, it, 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 it pleases me more than I can say that we're, we're going to give her no peace so that as soon as, as soon as she can decently make her exit, she's going to come and start working on it. On our little project. I know. It I makes know. me she's, so happy. Well, I'm, I'm delighted. I, I, I think she is too. She's really the same. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Kidding. Maybe they were keeping So she's been keeping me up on your, on your activities. And, yes! House check it the new apartment in Paris. Paris I heard which about is that. which is very much available for you guys. <laughs> no, I mean the whole the whole theory of that was, you know, it's good. it's a reasonable reasonable it's not a bad investment. No. My kids will enjoy having yeah. some use of it. Yeah. But it's basically the idea is it's for it's for the it's for the whole extended it's for the family. family. That's right. <laughs> So I'm going for the first time. They're doing all these good renovations. I'm going it's but it's still going to be big. So I'm doing this kind of for the first time in May. And then I'll be able to spread a jam. Such a beautiful time. Yeah, so I, I love it. I love it. It's really nice to uh, balance. I have to say, hi. Awesome. Oh, don't go away. Just stay right there. Hi. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hello, new. <laughs> Oh, where were you at? Yeah. The wow, I haven't seen you in a while either. Yeah. Uh, very good to see you. I'm glad I barred in. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, in the case of the book, as I write this, yes, yes. Yeah. You know, you've got a big group for me in the final class. No, no, I, but we, we, we have a regular schedule for us. I, 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 I just think everything else. Thank you. So as I go through the process of writing this, I have a question about characterizing that aspect of it or something. Hey, Mike. Yeah, uh, sure. 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 Sure.
the benefit or the challenge of knowing how the current moment has turned out yet. <laughs> so we are going to spare you the retrospective piece since it hasn't happened. Um, and so I think that we're going to introduce this panel with probably more questions than uh, conclusions. A lot of the earlier panels, when they introduced them, had the benefit of saying, like, this is basically how the fight <laughs> over the DMCA started, and this is how it turned out. Uh, we don't know that. We don't know how it turned out. So we're going to just jump right in and tell you where we think we are right now. Um, and I think two influences that really affect how IP advocacy is happening right now. One was alluded to in the panel before this, which is there is this tension, um, this question of whether or not organizations, public interest organizations, and industry organizations and companies that are all really fundamentally aligned on specific issues of IP policy can work in coalitions if other large concerns and questions about privacy or consolidation separate them. So can we still work closely on those issues in which we are aligned when there is this sort of both organizational and public awareness of these areas where we are really far apart? The other, I think, is that for better and for worse, these are played out in a different sort of public scrutiny, that both social media and changes within traditional media mean that a lot more of this has to be done, not just in response to sort of the strategic interests of your organization, but also, as Carrie alluded to, to the opinions of your members, to the opinions of people who aren't your members and are just on Twitter. and so. Those both really inform how this is done. Um, and so we've also heard, I think, a skepticism about what might happen in Congress right now and what might be coming. And with the perhaps unenviable task of saying what will happen in Congress, what is likely, I would like to introduce Sasha Moss, who's a senior director at Insight Public Affairs, to talk a little bit about what serious prospects, for whatever value of serious you want to use, um, what serious prospects for legislation with uh, public interest intellectual property implications do you see coming up? Thank you for um, inviting me to speak on the panel today. And I just want to do a quick shout out to Bob Schwartz, who mentioned in the panel, second panel today that 
the young ones are now going to be suffering through the madness that he suffered through in the late 80s and mid 90s. So thank you, Bob. <laughs> We're suffering. But I also want to give a quick note as well. Um, Bob's one of the reasons why I'm working in this field. In law school, I studied Betamax case and went through congressional record documents on DMCA. When I met Bob, I was pretty starstruck. So I'm the leader of the fan club. Moving on, when I think of intellectual property, I like to dump it into two buckets, not three, which is copyrights and then everything else, so patents and trademarks and so on and so forth. Why? Because of the registration locations. And that's how um, Congress views it as well. So in, in their minds, as we all know in this, in this room, when they think of copyright, they think of the Copyright Office. When they think of patents and trademarks, they think of the PTO. Therefore, they split it up. And you see this within the jurisdiction of the House. So for example, former Chairman Goodlatte decided to move copyright out of the jurisdiction of the IP subcommittee, and he moved it to the full committee. That was a big, bold move. It was a strange move. There are many theories, most political, as why he did this. I'm not going to get into those now, because we are short on time. Actually, you're in the clear. They found a new room for the exam. Whoa! Uh, <laughs> you guys have a 25-minute presentation prepared each, right? Definitely. <laughs> yeah, I've got slides and cat photos. I love cats. Um, not an impressive so, move. So, as opposed, <laughs> now, no, in this, as opposed to the Senate, Senate where <laughs> the jurisdiction goes to the normal process of subcommittee, full committee, and floor vote. Now, knowing that, I was kind of addressing the issues of public interest in intellectual property and what my crystal ball is telling me. Uh, regarding the House side, I see movement on the Case Act, which would create a small claims court within the Copyright Office being pushed by our friends in the photography community. Um, CCA has done some phenomenal work on this, this piece of legislation. I'd love for you to consult with Allie or Matt, who's here, to talk about the options between opt-in and opt-out and why the Recreate Coalition, which Insight helps run, has been vehemently opposed to this piece of legislation that was introduced by Representative Jeffries and Collins last Congress. Um, the second bill I see popping up is um, this quote unquote shrouded, shrouded modernization effort, which is essentially a bill that would remove the jurisdiction of the Library of Congress to appoint her own register of the Copyright Office and give that power to the executive in conjunction with members of the House and the Senate working with the librarian. As a woman of the right, I used to work for a Republican member in the House. I hate executive overreach. That, to me, just makes my head, my head spin, my eyes open up, and I think that is just the worst thing we can do. We want to empower the first branch. That's what legislative branch is. So that bill did pass last Congress um, through a pretty easy floor vote and moved to the Senate where it was stonewalled. And that's the power of the Senate. My boss, Josh Mellick, says the Senate's are bad bills go to die, and it's because of the deference the Speaker gives to the minority and also his chairman. We see a lot of drama between McConnell and Schumer and the Democrats all the time, but when it comes down to McConnell is one of the most diplomatic leaders because he will consult with his chairman and chairwoman first before he makes a decision regarding votes. And he always respects minority holds. And luckily for us, we have Senator Wyden, who's pretty good on our issues and will oftentimes place a hold on bills we disagree with if we can propose a case of why civil society does not think this will uh, help the balanced movement. So Senate, what's going on there? A lot of funky stuff, <laughs> to be quite <laughs> honest. In the Senate, you're seeing more patent arguments. Uh, Section 101 reform or patents up a subject eligibility matters and in our party's review are hot topics for two two senators, Senator Coons and Senator Tillis. They've been holding roundtables on the topic of 101, and IPR has been issued that Senator Coons has been very passionate about for many, many years. It's because he was an inventor and he believes it stifles innovation. Uh, Charles Dwan, to in the back over there, can tell you all about how IPR does not do that, and IPR actually helps with better patents by creating an invalidity system, which is akin to the European system of invalidity or an infringing. IPR is great. Let's not ruin it. Now, something I would like to note before I kind of go into my wish list on quick other bills that might turn up is that if you keyword search on GovTrack or Congress.gov right now, any term related to intellectual property, you're going to see a whole ton of bills from this congressional session and the previous one. And how many bills did we see passed in the last session? One. The Music Modernization Act. And why is that? It's because oftentimes members off committee will introduce bills about intellectual property concerns, but because they're not on the committee or they're a junior member, or if you're the case of a certain member from the Republican Party on the House side, 
who just had a libertarian bent and calls himself an inventor, you want to drop this stuff so you can see if you can get some press. And more often than not, you can't because sometimes members don't like to hear it. They're one out of 400 plus. <laughs> They're not that important in the greater scheme of things. Again, I worked for a House member, so it's always really great saying that every so often, as opposed to the Senate. Bills rarely drop in the Senate. Most bills originate in the House. Senate companions are very rare, and if they do happen, they're incredibly fleshed out, they're thoughtful, and they have gone through multiple rounds of editing and input from all of y'all here. So just to quickly wrap up, what, I like, what I'd like to see is some kind of statutory damage reform. I've been working on this, gosh, for the past six years. It's very near and dear to conservatives' hearts. So I think there could be a chance for that to happen. I don't know if this session, maybe next session. Um, there has been ideas of some kind of copyright troll reform happening. That would be cool. I don't know what it would look like at this current juncture, so I can't speak to that um, thoroughly. And then we have the issues surrounding Article 13, now known as Article 17, or the quote unquote meme killer. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty details. I'm sure all of you know what this is. There is a possibility of that being introduced or some form of it in the Senate. Um, do I believe it has any chance of passing? No, because the administration has signaled that they are not in favor of this type of legislation in the United States because it could severely impact U.S. business. And oftentimes, as we all know, collaboration, coalitions are key, strange bedfellows. If, we if we're going to work with the administration on this issue, I'd be happy to have them on our side and guiding members in the Senate and the House to not introduce or not move a piece of legislation like this. And just to wrap it up into a tight little bow, uh, something again, calling out Charles Dwan from our street again, ITC or National Trade Commission modernization efforts are happening. They're in the Ways and Means Committee, specifically regarding patent jurisdiction of the administrative court. That could happen this round. That's a sincere possibility, which is quite exciting to weirdos like me who took a uh, one semester credit on the, on the ITC for because I thought it sounded cool in law school. <laughs> and that would allow for the domestic industry requirement to be modified. So essentially, it would help US business when they're working with um, counterparts across the country for infringing pieces of technology or works. And that's a quite exciting advancement. It's, it's been introduced multiple sessions. Uh, it looks like it'll be reintroduced later this month. And from what we're hearing, it could pick up some steam. So again, when you think of when I think of IP in this this world right now, I think of it copyrights and then everything else because that's how Congress thinks about it. And regarding the coalition efforts and the tech lash that my colleague Ryan brought up last panel, it's real. It's it's not great. It's really not great being an advocate right now in the tech lash because we benefited from a previous administration really getting along with tech. We benefited from Republicans and their libertarian leans, members of Congress, embracing technology as a new emittive economy. And now we're seeing a huge backlash. So when I like to advocate, when I work on legislation now, I think of it not as a technology policy issue, but as a legal issue, as a pure legal issue, and a pure consumer issue. And I think we need to separate those narratives when we work with uh, Congress men and women, because they still think of copyright as tech. This is from the 90s. They need to think of copyright as a consumer issue, as a legal issue. And the technology industry, while I adore it, maybe isn't fertile ground for them to be uh, thinking as a kid, even though our best allies on these issues are usually individuals within the tech sector, and they do phenomenal work. We just really need to get to the bare bones of uh, the legal parameters to find balance in the IP movement. And with that, I will conclude. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so sort of thinking about in earlier panels, we heard that there can be this, um, this influence of sort of international processes, such as those as WIPO, or um, legislative developments in European countries or the EU that have an effect on uh, what's happening in the US. So if we don't see space to move mm -hmm. on a policy issue in the US, sometimes people who want legislation or want change will go and see if they can get it somewhere else and then bring it back. Um, and so to talk a little bit about that issue, we have Ali Sternberg next, who is the senior policy counsel at the CCIA, which is the Computer and Communications Industry Association. And so Ali, you know, sort of in the hot news segment here, can you tell us what, um, what now after the sort of EU 
change? What do we think, like, what effect will that have on the rest of the world? What are the ways that uh, advocates and policymakers and industry in the U.S. is looking at that? Yeah. <clears throat> so, as, again, folks here know, the EU copyright directive um, that seen is really controversial to a lot of people in this room, I would say. A lot of citizens and, and small businesses and creators and civil society and academics and everything from in the U.S. and abroad that it, um, just this week, um, the member states uh, went through another process where they officially voted on what Parliament had recommended. Sorry to you colleagues if I'm not <laughs> using the correct terms. But it, it, so they, but this is happening. But what that means is it's not over yet. The, the EU directive still has to, am I not going to the mic? Okay. Sorry about that. So the EU directive still needs to be implemented in member states. So, so while it, it has been a um, disappointing upset, it was a really close vote despite all the stakeholders that um, worked really hard to try to get some of the controversial amendments, Article 11, now 15, and 13, now 17. Um, there still are opportunities to kind of influence the way that different member states implement this legislation. There's still opportunities for litigation against the, the, um, the various member state implementations. So while it, it um, while it is discouraging, you can't, we, as we know throughout the history of copyright and the public interest, um, you can't win every fight, and there's going to be definitely going to keep being additional fights, often over a lot of the same issues. A lot of these things are incremental. So it, it's still an opportunity for people to stay engaged, both within the different EU member states and also to try to discourage other countries from implementing laws that are similar to the EU copyright directive. And, Instead, encouraging um, laws that are similar to what we have in the U.S., the, the DMCA safe harbors, and a lot of the other balanced copyright regime that has enabled driving uh, digital economy and, and digital interests, in addition to the benefits for consumers and librarians and libraries and all of the, the many different people that we all work together with. Um, there, was, there definitely are some lessons out of what happened in Europe. Uh, I spoke with my counterpart at CCIA in Brussels to kind of get her take on um, what she learned from the process and what would be good advice for other countries that are uh, thinking about similar laws focused on the ancillary copyright issue um, about the press publisher's right and the filtering kind of safe harbor related right. So. Um, a lot, a lot of her advice is going to be similar to things that we've experienced here. It, it really is great to have these powerful coalitions of um, civil society, academics, and uh, the library constituents, industry. It, um, that can be definitely be influential, um, especially to domestic counterparts. Um, as much as we can, um, you might be right. It, it's not always powerful to be hearing from foreign interests. It really can be helpful to hear from domestic interests. So in the press publishers related right, it would be helpful to hear from local publishers. Um, we've seen um, these similar laws being passed in Spain and Germany. And after, and after they've been passed, um, we often see that the local publishers are disappointed that they're getting less traffic from um, when, when, these, when search engines or, or news aggregation is, is not sending as much traffic to them, which is the opposite of what they want. Um, so and, and, uh, Google News shut down in Spain. Yeah, some of the German publishers were disappointed with what the effects of these laws were. Um, so it, it can be really helpful to hear from the local, local, in, local domestic industry affected. But it, it, it's hard. Some of the local publishers in, the, in Europe were saying that they wouldn't cover these political campaigns um, for members that are up if they, if they didn't support the bill. So it's, it definitely is a, a challenge, but I think it's the power of all these different stakeholders working together that really means a lot. And then for the um, Article 13, now number 17, we've got to figure out a way to say that shorter. Um, I, I think this, it's similar. Um, it, it, was seen, it was a tough um, issue with when it was perceived as just being U.S. industry 
that was maybe more vocal at the beginning. It really helps to have um, smaller domestic tech industry, the consumer groups, um, everyone kind of working together. And um, But it, it is different when there's a different culture of lobbying than, than we have in the US. But mobilizing local companies is really important so that they're not kind of free riding or on the um, US companies or not, um, not paying attention and then realizing how much it really is going to affect them, not just the um, US stakeholders. Um, but I think another, another thing that we kind of saw in the EU fight um, was that some, some of the rights holders kind of sought to, um, to like, tarnish the relationship between the business community and the public interest stakeholders. But I think that one of the reasons that that happened is that it shows how powerful coalitions can be when all these different groups and interests come together and align, um, and just how effective it can be. So we're going to keep seeing um, these implementation across Europe, and we're going to maybe see other countries considering whether they want to follow the EU, the EU model or something more like the USCMCA that we have here. And I think it's definitely going to be more opportunities for great lawyers and advocates to, to follow the lessons that we've learned throughout history and so many of the great things that we've heard from my colleagues today. Um, I'm really happy to be here and inspired. Thank you. Um, so one of the things that was talked about on the panel before this was the um, the valuable but unpredictable nature of uh, turning on the internet bat signal. And uh, so next up we have uh, Shrevan Sai, who's the senior public policy manager and counsel at the Wikimedia Foundation. And uh, because Wikipedia and that ecosystem was a big part of that, um, the question for you, I guess, is how does a company like Wikimedia harness and represent such a large user community? And how do you determine sort of what is in and out of scope for you and your public policy work? Um, and then how does it sort of relate to your ability to motivate, both motivate and respond to your community members? Right. Um, so, you know, I like to describe, when I, when I tell people I work for the Wikimedia Foundation, I like to describe that as being Oh, we're the nonprofit that provides the back end for projects like Wikipedia or any of the 180, almost 300, uh, you know, 100 to almost 200 active and 300 languages, uh, language Wikipedias that there are, other projects like Wikimedia Commons. I tell people there's all these hundreds of different projects. We provide the back end for that. By which I mean, sure, the servers and stuff, we have tons of incredibly talented people working in tech for it, but you know, we also have a, you know, a handful of lawyers back there receiving service of process, uh, responding to DMCA requests and stuff like that. So we provide the back end there. Um, and I do that to distinguish between uh, not just the Wikimedia Foundation and Wikipedia, usually English language Wikipedia is what people are talking to me about, um, but also to distinguish between what we in the foundation call sort of the, the, the spheres that we distinguish between the foundation the community, and the movement. And all of this comes down to, and in, I'll, I'll sort of detail that in a little bit, but it comes down to sort of how we represent, what, what it means to represent a group and what it means to have a constituency. Because I, I, you know, I, can't, I can say that I represent the Wikimedia movement in the same way that I can say I represent the state of Texas. Right, it's where I'm from. Uh, it's it's you know it's it's a part of me, and it, I I am representative of a part of it. But at the same time, to say that the views expressed upon the blog of the Wikimedia Foundation are obviously going to be the views of the millions of people who are part of that movement. Well, that's no, that's that can't be true because there are millions of people. Um, and so when it turn when, when we talk about sort of harnessing um, that energy. I, I, you know, it's almost like people, people harness themselves. It's not that we are, I think one of the ways to put this is, okay, so who the community is. This is, and will include people who are volunteering uh, their time to contribute content to a Wikipedia project, to Wikimedia Commons. It'll include people who take the time to edit those projects. 
take the time to resolve disputes between people who are editing at cross purposes on those projects. Um, okay, so is that the scope of our community? Well, that's not everything that's visible to us, and it's not visible to us all simultaneously. There are other ways that people participate as well. People show up and form affiliate groups. There's a local DC chapter that does amazing work. They will organize people and do edit-a-thons uh, with local libraries, with academic institutions, with the National Archives, and they do that work. Are there members, are there board members, are there uh, chapter members, the community? Well, again, only in part. You don't have to do any of those things, and still you can be a part of that community. We have listservs, we have so many listservs, uh, of people who will discuss the state of projects, who will discuss the state of public policy and our role in public policy. Um, is that our community? Well, it's a subset, and it's a, you know, a vocal subset, people with strong opinions about things. But it's a subset of the community in the same way the constituents who show up at a particular town hall at a particular event are constituents of that district. So even if we wanted to be purely representative of all of the different aspects of that community, let alone all the different aspects of the broader, what we call the broader movement, and people who are affected by and influence and, and uh, who you know, take advantage and, and use the advantage of their art projects, if we, even if we wanted to be purely reactively representative of that, we, we just couldn't. We wouldn't have the visibility to do that. There are so many things that there is no consensus on with all of those millions of people. Now, at the same time, we do have this foundation that is dedicated to the mission that this community is dedicated to, that this community is devoting its time to. So, we can know what the, the, the goals are, what the mission is, what the values are. And we can use our experience, our particular experience, to try and divine what policy steps need to be taken in order to meet those goals. Okay, so what should a copyright law look like in order to ensure uh, free and open knowledge? Okay, what should uh, this particular telecom policy look like in order to do that? And, you know, I can make those arguments on behalf of the foundation, I and my colleagues. Uh, we can go and say, this is what we think, and this is why. And we can say that on behalf of the foundation. Can we say that we say this on behalf of the community and the movement? Well, that depends. And that's where we engage in a conversation with our community and, and our movement. And it is, and it's, it's a dialogue. Um, it's not just us saying, this is where we shall go. I think anybody who's had experience with Wikimedian communities knows that's not a great way to make friends on the talk page is to dictate from a top-down status, this is where we shall go. Um, and because I think all of these projects are built around this, this concept of a collaborative effort where you trust that other people are operating in good faith, um, that, that's an important thing for us to bring to the table with this. Um, to say, this is how we think this is going to go, this is what we believe, and this is why. And, some of the things that you, that, Meredith, that you mentioned about um, sort of how social media affects things, I think has to do with questions about trust, about insider-outsider status, and about how, like, why people believe the things they do or why people trust uh, the sources that they do. And a lot of that has to do with, with not just the what or the why, but the how. Not just uh, what my position is, why I have it. How did I reach this thing? How did, we, how did we engage in this? If we say we as the foundation on what we believe is on, you know, in uh, what we believe is on behalf of the mission, uh, you know, did these meetings, met with these people, are working in coalition with these other organizations, with these industries, um, we want to explain how and why that happened. And that how is important in explaining and uh, explaining to people and getting that trust and showing why you know, uh, where these, these uh, decisions get made. Because that, otherwise, it becomes this question of, of oh, Washington, you know, inside the Beltway, DC Insider, um, and if I can't see the motivations, if I can't see the why, but I also can't see the how, the mechanisms by which those coalitions get made, um, then what reason do I have to trust that? Because I know that there are 
Look, this is Washington, D.C. I know that there are uh, coalitions that are born simply out of, uh, out of pure fiscal, uh, you know, pure fiscal self-interest. Um, so making that explanation, and uh, having that transparency is a big part of that, but also ensuring that it's a collaboration, which I think is true of coalitions with external, uh, external entities as well. Thank you. Um, so there is a sort of absurdist uh, moment here where I have to introduce Prue Adler, um, <laughs> so our last panelist, who some of you may have met. <laughs> to give you a moment to sort of plunge <clears throat> yourself, I'll ask you, we have two questions. The first, Terry stole our thunder is, libraries, aren't they impressive? <laughs> so, yes or no? Yeah. Um, so, of course, uh, we've come to the end of the day, but um, we wanted to ask you, Prue, to just sort of um, give us your perspective and sort of a sense of where you think we are. We have, you know, these two original panels that talked about the work um, around the database directive and the work around the DMCA. And then... Uh, a panel that talked about the sort of 15 or 20 years after that, about really different uh, movements, the SOPA PIPA moment, and then also Marrakesh. And then now we've tried to give you a very rough sampling of where we think we are right now. And I guess our question to you would be looking back after that, in what ways do you think this is really a continuum, or are we at a moment where things are really changing? And so you're lucky in that you can sort of reach back and talk about any of the moments and draw the ties you want. And then after that, we'll have a moment for the other panels. But I wanted to give you pride of place as your <clears throat> sort of first responder on that. Um, uh, Peter promised me that I could be brief, which I am going to. Um, but I first wanted to say how much I appreciated all of the panels today, all of the comments today, everybody's participation. Um, it has really been special, and I think it's for all of us, when people were talking about some of the work that I helped stimulate, I think it was actually every single person who collaborated, participated, and worked very, very hard. Um, and I think it speaks to what John Band was talking about, which is trust, it's what Nancy was talking about. We had a phenomenal team for the different, the different coalitions. We still do in this, this current work. Um, I think that as colleagues, what um, Bob Schwartz said when he came into the lobby and into the, the lunch area today, he choked up. I think that happened to a lot of us because we worked so closely together for so long that we were family. Um, some of us in the database coalition try and get together at least once a year through restaurant week. <laughs> and we have done other things together. Um, like one of the leaders of the Digital Future Coalition who got married a year ago, Jeff Turner, who couldn't be here today. So we were able to celebrate different parts in our lives, which I think is a testament to a different kind of success, um, which was nice. Um, but what I really wanted to say was, number one, thank you to WCL for organizing this, uh, for inviting everybody to participate. Um, Meredith and Peter um, for reaching out and organizing this, um, who came to ARL one day and said, we really want to do a public interest panel session, but didn't tell me that it was going to be in my honor. <laughs> so there I am throwing out names and getting all excited about what we could do, and then all of a sudden the agenda comes in. and I'm... It was in the footnotes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but... It's, it's been a truly special day, so I do want to thank everybody who was involved in, in organizing this. Um, and it wasn't just, it wasn't just special today, it was special working with all of you on the different issues that we all worked with. And from all reports about what you heard today, we were successful, as best we could be, and particularly around database legislation. Because as it was said several times today, between DMCA and database and other work, 
the internet would not have thrived and become what we know. Everybody can take credit for that. And that's really, really important, I think. Uh, Michael said it pretty well when he was talking about the, the internet and consumer electronics. Um, so thank you, everyone. I will say, as my husband knows, this is hard for a New England girl to take all of this in. <laughs> it's, um, it's not easy. Um, but one of the things that Bob and I were talking about, when Jonathan said, and I think Ted Whitehouse mentioned it, because he and I talked about it, that we had a lot of fun and that we thought we had much more fun, and this was in the database context, <laughs> than the folks who were pressing for more protection for databases. Um, we just really, really enjoyed each other's companies. But the same held for the Digital Future Coalition. And in that respect, I want to do a shout out to Ruth Rogers, who was head of the HRRC, who could not be here today. But HRRC and her work was truly the model for Digital Future Coalition. And that taught us how to be successful in a very important way. And I think we need to give credit to the work of that organization and Ruth for helping us understand going forward how other successful coalitions could work and be successful going forward. Um, but in the DMCA context, um, as you know, in all legislative campaigns, you put together one-pagers that talk about what you want and why you're advocating. And, and one of the panelists today put together something called Hollywood versus the Librarians. Now, I'm not sure I can do a true dramatic reading, and I can't, I honestly can't list about 80% of what's on this page because we're in a chapel. <laughs> um, but it says, whose side are you on? Members of Congress are faced with deciding to which copyright reform bill they should lend their support. Hollywood studios and book publishers urge support for HR 2281, which would give content providers total power over readers, viewers, and other uses. Librarians, educators, archivists, and other productive users of content are urging support for HR 3048, which would bring fairness and balance to the copyright law in the digital age. On whose side would you rather be? Hollywood or the librarians? A balanced comparison as to why who deserves your support. Hollywood, where they are, not in my hometown. Librarians, my hometown. <laughs> <laughs> Who they know, the president, city council, attitude, <laughs> me first, here to help. <laughs> and finally, where next year? The Riviera, buying a Buick. <laughs> um, thank you, Bob Schwartz, for that. And I'm happy to share um, during the reception. I will pass this around for others to see what was said. Um, but I think that demonstrates that we did have a lot of fun. Um, and we had to have good humor going into these battles. They were pretty intense. Um, I also promised Peter that I would say um, for the database panel that at its height, we had 117 members of the database coalition, which was pretty darn exciting. Um, and another part of the history that Pat Offer Heidi knows is that in the mid-90s when we were hearing that the green paper was going to happen and then white paper and then we would have legislation and WIPO, um, Pam Samuelson, who regularly came to ARL uh, to work because she needed an office when she was in DC, introduced Peter and myself because she recognized that there was going to be a need for a strong public interest coalition. And that's how he and I first met and how we started planning our mischief and reaching out to other folks to see about interest. And yes, indeed, there was an organizing meeting at, AA, at AU here. Um, and the amazing thing about that day was we had several presentations of what we saw coming down the pike. We had lunch, and then we worked into groups where we tackled mission, what we were going to cover, a number of issues that became 
foundational to that coalition, and we did it in one day, including a description of who we were. <laughs> and I think that shows that people were hungry and they really wanted to put all the oars in the water and get started. <laughs> so with that, I think I'm... Well, um, thank you very much. We, I'd love to have an opportunity for any of the panelists here to comment on sort of what you had heard from each other, open it up to the public. But I do want to, um, we have time for questions, but we only have 12 minutes before the champagne is served. So um, I would say pick your best questions. Does anyone here have a Mike, Carol. So I want to add a footnote to the story of, of crew. Uh, we didn't make, this didn't fit within the, the agenda because it was really, we've been really talking about Judiciary Committee coalitions and things. But I also worked with Peru on open access, which was really not a Judiciary Committee issue. And we had to continuously push back against Alan and the publishers that kept trying to make it <laughs> a copyright policy issue. Um, it, but it was a government information uh, issue. But. But Pru, within, and this is a coalition more within the library community than, than um, across disciplines, but, but Pru really, as, as we've heard, was, was one of the thought leaders in both uh, helping to spin out a, a separate focused organization, Spark, that was going to tackle this problem while ARL could work in partnership. Uh, we were in the ARL, uh, the National Institutes of Health, were walked up to the line, they were ready to mandate that everybody they funded would have to give us a copy of their paper within a year. They then got comments and that, that looked a whole lot like a legal brief mm -hmm. and the NIH got cold feet. And for four years we waited with this voluntary policy that didn't work. And then a moment came in 2008 where we could get language in an appro appropriations bill to turn mandatory or, uh, permissive into mandatory. And Peru was part of the strategy around that. Um, and so uh, as we start to chalk up all the victories, let's not forget that important open access victory, which then leads to the Holdren memo, which generalizes the idea that publicly funded research should be available to the public that paid for it, uh, a simple principle that even members of Congress should get, still haven't, but it's, it's, it's executive policy, it's working, and Peru's hands or fingerprints are all over that policy. Peter? So, through uh, having opened the door with uh, Hollywood and the libraries, there's a, a story that I always think of uh, in which I, I learned something about, about policy advocacy along with Prue. I no longer remember what the issue was. I no longer remember what we had been doing that afternoon. But I do remember that at the end of the day, you and I ended up in Chairman Bliley's office. And we're talking sort of very casually about all of this stuff with, with him. Uh, the fact that we were there talking casually with the chairman of the Commerce Committee at the end of the afternoon is, is some testimony to the nature of the, the, the deep and, and positive relationships that, that Prue had built over years on the Hill. But I still remember um, Chairman Bliley sort of beginning to talk about, about this, this, the Cyprus crisis. Do you remember that? And, and he asked us, he said, why do you think over all of these years that the United States has, has systematically favored Greece in the, in the conflict over the territorial conflict over the, the fate of Cyprus? And we were deeply puzzled by this question, or at least I was. And not just puzzled, not, not only did I not know the answer, but I couldn't quite figure out what it had to do with anything. And he said, it, it's because there is a, a Greek restaurant in every congressional district in the United States, whereas Turkish restaurants are scattered very, very, they're very thin on the ground and tend to be concentrated in certain urban areas. 
And the, the lesson, of course, the analogy that the chairman was drawing was to libraries and to the unique ability of libraries by virtue of their distribution in every town, on every campus, in every community to become a focus point for clarifying and then expressing consensus around issues of access to information. And, and I, I, almost everything I know, little though it may be, about policy advocacy, I learned from Peru. But this was one lesson, at least, that I learned with Peru and, and always remember. So uh, thank you for joining us today, Peru. Thank you all for coming and, 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 and sticking with us. I think there's a tremendous, tremendous amount of rich material in, in the panels to today. And I'm looking forward to doing more with it in, 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 in weeks and months to come. So again. Through our gratitude. Person to thank. That's my husband, Doug, who has been very patient all this time. <laughs> um, and every once in a while, I would come home and I said, I have a legal question. <laughs> I need help. <laughs> um, but I think that he and our, our son have been, and now daughter in law, incredible, help, helpful people and loving family along the way. Well, on, that <laughs> on that note, we're not really going to um, try to steer it back to any specific technical conversations of the next six months in Congress or anything like that. But we hope this is the start of a conversation of sort of talking about what the, the sort of next phase of public interest IP policy work will look like. And so we hope to see everyone again soon. But for now, Please join us in the reception down below for a toast to Peru and a toast to Carrie's observation about the formidable <laughs> nature of libraries. Um, and one last thing is we actually do have a uh, photographer, Mark, will be um, staying with us for the uh, reception. And so if you want to ask to get a picture, if you have some colleagues you'd like to get a shot with, please feel free to grab him and, and say so, and we'll make those available after the event. Thank you. So Gladys and uh, uh, <laughs> and a staff member and uh, right. going Sorry, to a formal event and sitting up to the house so representative of the Because I can only do it if you're so I actually just I love that. I just know I was so I was no idea where he was going. Thank you. It's so, it's so freeing, right? It is really nice. Well, say hi to all of you. Say hi to you. Well, we're not back in Barcelona this year. Oh, that's it. Okay. Well, I'm going to be you I'm glad we got uh, a reprieve. I think so nice. Uh, I think what happened is we preserved it a long time ago and the program shifted. Right? We hadn't we didn't realize it was that I mean, I'm not sure how well it would have gotten that. We would have done it on the stairs to you. Everybody had to project. Lots of noise. Yeah. Well, that's the examination and practice. And who's that? It's a, or it's a final oral, it's a oral advocacy class. And I think it's just good. You know, sometimes you get there and it's not in the courtroom you thought it was going to be, and you're
That's right. That's right. It's all part of the test. I'm part of the test. Well, contrary to advocates, we end up with the room. Uh, you, you may appreciate this uh, yes. bit of a bookend. So, a number of library organizations were in Wiley's office meeting with Wiley. Yes. And he explained to them that he had literally just met that morning with Jack Lenty. And he told Jack Lenty, he told us that he told Jack that he couldn't be with him on this because, like with restaurants. Really? So, again, oh, that's most interesting. <laughs> that's great. I thought, I thought you were going to push it. I don't know. <laughs> Just, uh, and I believe that. I, maybe, I, maybe I was naive and I'm still naive, but I, I actually believe we told him that. Yeah. So he didn't do the Cypress part. He did not do the Cypress Yeah, because the Cypress part was the, was the lead in, in, uh, in this. In this in this late afternoon conversation, and I was just, I was completely, I had no idea. Oh, it's a good head thing. Yeah, absolutely. Especially coming from him, I mean, you know, he looks so kind of, you know, magisterial. Yeah, somewhere that tells me, or, some, such or, or something, that tells me what happened with yeah. OER when, like, when, some big meeting, and then, and now I know there's this OSI, I, I, I read the way you're, you know, like, so I got that much. But you had a much better sense of, you lived yeah, this. From the get-go. So, you know, like, something happened. Yeah. From the you know, preliminary work I used to do, and then boom, eating and off we go. Yep, pick the names. I think it took, it took us like a week from there to pick a logo, and that was it. You know. <laughs> sort of problem solving and defining stuff but nothing that, that was like here's an overview yeah oh, nobody's evolved. nobody's done this that's been actually a problem is that we don't have a you know who peter subaru is uh -uh. so he's a guy who's basically was chronicling, chronicling the open access movement oer has never had that chronicle Is it a brief history? Oh, so TJ. That's interesting. TJ was the. Uh, Look at that. Wait, wait. Let me just let me just get the title here. TJ who? List. So he was the program officer who followed that. Yeah. 
I haven't looked at this to see how accurate it is. Um, he's dating it back to ninety. Mm -hmm. This is so valuable. Thank you. This makes sense. Okay. I, I, I bet this chronology is going to be pretty close to accurate. <laughs> so listen, you're also a hero because Natalia. Yeah, I've sent her. I sent her a side note today, just sort of reinforcing your comments and saying, look. Need Currently, a, there's no there there. I know, I know, and I've said, look, you need a thesis. What's what's the? Thesis? Well, her thesis is um, about securitization leading development of U.S. policy, and I'm like, great, but still nothing about Khan here. Yeah, yeah. I I basically copy pasted your <laughs> comments from the Word document, and I sort of translated them, I think, into what I think she was like. This is what I understand her to be asking. She says she gets it, but I'm sort of the horse has been led to water at this point, you know. I won't interrupt just uh, thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Where, where uh, you're staying? I'm coming. I'll come. Yeah, I'll, I'll. So, yeah. Um, I, I'm going to be sad if she can't get to go here. But yeah. currently, she's not at golf. Yeah. She just asked for another week, and I said, you're going to have to ask the other people on this committee. Yeah. I gave her, I said I, I can do that, but, yeah, I mean. It's not going to make any difference to me, because I'm still only going to, you right. know, it's not going to be that long to read. It is not. Um, but and and I, I have to look to you, because I don't know what counts as columns. So. Well, I said to her, anything that is about people communicating with each other, yeah. you know, if it, you know, uh, since this is a technology that is going to 